Welcome to this Royal Meteorological Society uh, meeting. Um, I'm Liz Bentley, I'm Chief Executive at the Royal Met Society and uh, delighted to welcome you here to ECMWF. So I think start by saying a big thank you to ECMWF for hosting us here today in this wonderful lecture theatre. Um, uh, so I have a few slides uh, to just do some basic housekeeping and then um, I'll hand over to our first speaker. And during the course of the afternoon, we've got a couple of talks before we break for uh, tea and coffee um, and then a couple of talks afterwards and there'll be time for a Q&A. So we should have time for questions at the end of each presentation uh, and particularly for Emily, we'll take questions at the end of her presentation because she won't be here for the Q&A end. But any questions that we can't get through, we will pick up at the end during the Q&A before we close. Um, so health and safety wise, um, if you need any first aid assistance, uh, please get in touch with one of my team um, who are sat at the back of the lecture theatre. I don't know, Kat, if you just want to stand up so everyone's aware if you do need any first aid assistance today. Um, and fire procedures, so we're not expecting a fire alarm today. Uh, if we do hear an alarm, we need to exit at the two fire exits that you can see marked uh, with signs at the front. Can I also just draw your attention inside your note badge? There is a little map which will give you directions for the evacuation. But effectively, we go outside into the car park. We wait in the car park until um, we're told we can come back in the building. Please don't go off site because we need to just check everybody uh, is out of the building. So we'll do that uh, if we do hear an alarm. And then I've just a, a few slides uh, around the work of the Royal Met Society. I know many of you are already members and engaged, but for those of you that aren't, um, the first is about our Met Matters. So this is our public outreach arm of the Royal Met Society. Um, lots of interesting uh, blogs and articles uh, relating to weather and climate. I, I think it's probably worth just saying a little bit around the work that we've been doing in the energy sector at the Royal Met Society. So. Uh, a couple of years ago, we introduced, well, a number of fellowships uh, at the Royal Met Society to focus on different sectors, and one of those was a focus on the energy sector. So we fund a PhD or a postdoc to work with us one day a week to help us to uh, bring together people across the energy sector, uh, those working in academia, doing research in this area. Uh, we have a special interest group, which I think many of you will be familiar with. But if you aren't, please do come and have a chat with myself or Ben, who is sat at the front, who is our current fellow uh, working on the energy sector uh, at the Royal Met Society. And Ben will be presenting today um, a report that we've written. This is the first time we've done this. Um, and it basically takes the state of the UK climate report that the Met Office produces annually, uh, but uh, produces a focus port report for the energy sector. And as I say, this is the first time we've done it. It gets launched in about a week's time, hopefully. And uh, Ben's going to present on that today. But we would welcome feedback on that. Um, you know. Does it meet your needs? Does it have the information that you require? Are the things missing that you would like to see in future versions of the report? Because we will, we'd like to produce this annually. So uh, that would be really helpful. I'll keep talking while the projector is not working. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about three things. So there was Met Matters, which is our public engagement arm of the Royal Met Society. If you go on the Royal Met Society's website, rmets.org, you'll see a tab at the top called Met Matters. Uh, lots of uh, information in there. It's very much pitched at a general public audience. But it's an opportunity to share uh, not just areas of science of meteorology, but activities, those working in the profession as well. And any of you, if you're interested in getting your uh, science out to a wider audience, please do again, come and have a chat with me and we can kind of connect you. So you might you might want to write an article or a blog to go on on Met Matters. Um, I also wanted to just promote membership to the Royal Met Society. So. Those of you who don't know much about us, we are the learned and professional body for weather and climate. Uh, we're based in Reading, down in the centre of Reading. We're a, a charity, a small organisation. I just have 20 employees, but we rely on volunteers, over 600 volunteers who help us to deliver all the work that we do. Um, and we are here really to advance the science of meteorology and support those that work in the profession of meteorology. So we have a portfolio of uh, journals, eight international journals that scientists can publish their work in. We run over 50 events a year, many of them free to attend like this one. Um, and this is an in-person meeting, but we will be recording it and it will go on the society's uh, YouTube channel. So 
for those people, either you might want to watch it again back in slower time or people who can't make this meeting uh, can access the uh, the recording in slower time. So as I say, we run over 50 events a year. Um, our charitable work focuses on education. So we do a lot of work with schools, teachers uh, and thinking about uh, the curriculum. We've, we're about to have a big national curriculum review, I suspect, with a new government. And we'll be working very hard in that to make sure that weather and climate remains on the curriculum. Um, and then the other part of our charitable work is our science engagement. So we do a lot of work to educate a wider audience of people, uh, the general public, through a variety of different activities. Um, we're a membership organisation, so if you're not a member of the Royal Met Society and you would like to find out more again, probably just grab me at tea and coffee and I can give you a bit more information about that. And then my final slide, which I can't show you, uh, was about accreditation. Um, so we uh, are the professional body for weather and climate and we run the registered and chartered meteorologist schemes. So we're the only UK body that can deliver on this. And there are people in the audience who are registered and chartered. And I think particularly when you're working uh, between academia and industry, then the registered and chartered meteorologist can be extremely valuable as a badge of, you know, you meet a certain standard and you have the credentials to do the work that you're delivering. So I'm going to introduce uh, Ben. Um, Ben is a PhD student, Ben Hutchins, PhD student at Reading University. Um, his research covers, focuses on the potential applications of decadal predictions for energy, the energy sector. And as I already mentioned, Ben is a fellow in a fellowship scheme, one of our science engagement fellowship schemes at the Royal Met Society, working with us one day a week, uh, focusing on energy. I'll hand over to Ben. Oh. Thank you, Liz. Sorry, it's again here. So hopefully the slides stay up at least for some time. We might get halfway through and they might fail. So we'll see about that. But yeah, like Liz said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Reading, supervised by David, which is here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be telling you about the state of the UK climate for the energy sector report. So first of all, I'd like to thank the author team, um, some of which are here. So I've seen Matt and James. Nice to see you both. Um, I think Hannah's probably somewhere in the north. Um, it's quite a long journey down. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so um, Matt was the former Science Engagement Fellow for Energy, so he and Hannah basically came up with the idea for this report and sort of brought it through to reality. And then I sort of picked it up in June and have sort of carried it forwards. And then with the help of James, who's not affiliated with RMETs in any way, but who's been very generous with his time in helping us out. We also have the Energy Special Interest Group, which Liz has mentioned already, and all of these sort of public and private sector bodies have been really sort of instrumental in the genesis and the sort of design of the final report. So I'd like to thank them as well. So first of all, why write this report? So I think when Matt and Hannah were having the initial discussions upon sort of why this report might exist, they sort of identified that there was no systematic review of the weather and climate impacts on the UK energy sector within a given year. So National Grid do produce this winter review and consultation uh, where after each winter they sort of see how their forecasts for supply and for margin performed relative to expectations. Um, and there's also the State of the UK Climate Report, which Liz has already mentioned. So I guess the idea was to sort of merge these two things and to essentially write a State of the Climate Report, but more specifically for energy. And to give this context, I think what we want to explore is how the weather of 2023 to 2024 in this case relates to our expectations of past and future climates. And hopefully this will help us to prepare for future extremes. So we know from the third climate change risk assessment that we're expecting annual temperatures to increase for the UK. We're expecting less summer rainfall, more winter rainfall and potentially some sea level rise as well. Um, but we don't really go into much detail in this report of the impacts of climate change on the energy sector. So, oh, a little spoiler there. Um, so in terms of the scope of the report, what we can and can't do. So one of the main things that we can do is review the impacts of weather over the past year. And we do this using energy reanalysis data, which I'll get into on my method slides. Um, and this is how we identify challenging events for supply and demands. We can also potentially speculate on the future impacts on the energy sector, given our understanding of climate change. What we can't do is we can't drill into every single event which occurred between 2023 and 2024, um, particularly the sort of demand net wind events, times when sort of margins were tighter than they were normally. 
um, because there's quite a few of those within any given winter. So we've chosen to highlight two, uh, two case studies here. We also can't necessarily provide any advice to the energy sector on how to respond to this. So the author team, we're all meteorologists, energy meteorologists. We're not engineers or power system operators. So that's not our specialty, really. Uh, we also can't predict the future. So um, when we're speculating on uh, impacts with climate change, it really is just that speculation. So how do we do it? So this is kind of the method slide. So one of our main tools is reanalysis, also sort of colloquially referred to as maps without gaps, produced here at ECMWF. So these are spatially and temporally coherent maps of surface variables, so in this case, temperature and wind speeds, uh, where we take a best guess of the current state of the climate using the global observing system, combine that with a reforecast, and then you get these spatially coherent maps for the given period. Uh, we've also had a lot of help from Hannah in this when she created uh, these energy reanalysis data sets on one of her many postdocs. Um, and these essentially use empirical and physical relationships to quantify energy variables based on the meteorological variables which we've got here. So one example of this would be the relationships between electricity demand and temperature, which we can sort of break down into two um, sort of linear functions via heating degree days and cooling degree days. There's also physical relationships between wind speed and wind power. So this is just a simple power curve for any given wind speed. We expect a certain amount of output from a wind turbine. I think it's important to emphasize though that these are modeled energy variables. These are not the actual sort of gigawatts of demand or wind power generation that were seen during the periods. So Hannah has done some verification and they do perform quite well against the actual observed data, but I just thought that would be worth emphasizing. We also used some fault data, uh, fault data from DNOs. So we had data from Northern Power Grid and Electricity Northwest, and that was really helpful for uh, giving us more of an understanding of what the impacts of winter storms were um, in the north of England. We're hopeful that if we do this report next year, we might be able to get more um, DNO data because obviously that's not full coverage of the UK, uh, but that's kind of a next year problem. So. <laughs> So how do we generate electricity in 2023? So this is a figure from uh, the ESO. Most of it is from gas, just about, um, just over wind. So gas and coal is about 33% of our total capacity within 2023. Renewables made up about 50%, so mostly dominated by the wind, but also from solar and hydro. So the UK was a net importer of electricity in 2023. So interconnectors uh, with our European neighbours are becoming much more important as a part of the energy mix. And it was also the greenest year on record, um, mostly sort of contributed by um, the sort of windy conditions that we had. And then in terms of setting the scene for demand, so we saw our highest demand um, right in the middle of winter, I think during quite a cold spell um, at the 5 p.m. peak when everybody comes back from work and switches on their kettles and stuff. So that's when we saw the highest demand of about 44 gigawatts and the lowest demand was early in the morning in the summer of around 14 gigawatts. So in terms of, again, not a spoiler, uh, in terms of the state of the UK climate report and the sort of main findings from that and how they might relate to energy. Mm -hmm. So 2023 was the second warmest year on record since 1884, very narrowly pits to post by 2022. Uh, but obviously there's the warming trend there, which we're all aware of. It was the seventh wettest year on record since 1836, uh, mostly from a very wet autumn and spring. Um, and we also had lower wind speeds than the 1991 to 2020 average. And there's also a slight sort of stilling trend over the past 50 years, which is potentially interesting. We had a very active start to the storm season with seven named storms between September and December 2023 which was actually the most active start to the storm season since the naming system was introduced in 2015. And yeah, you can see some of the storms here. So in terms of how we sort of divided up the report, we divided it into two sections. So first looking at events where um, margins were tighter than they were normally relating to electricity supply and demand. And then the second section, which I'll get onto later, was infrastructure damages due to winter windstorms primarily. So just to set the scene for how temperature relates to demand and wind speed to wind generation, generally in the UK, um, demand is sort of inversely correlated with temperature during the summer when we have the sort of warmest temperatures we have the lowest electricity demands and the opposite is true during the winter so winter is essentially the more challenging period for high demand events and then as you might expect wind speed and wind power are pretty closely related 
So the way that we sort of fold these two variables together is by looking at demand net winds, which is just the simple differences between the weather dependent electricity demands and the wind power generation. And in this green line here, you can kind of see the peaks. Those are when there were potential issues um, for sort of supply security. Now, ESO do a lot of balancing measures, so we didn't really experience any severe issues. But we're just kind of highlighting the times where we had sort of less renewables than, than we would expect. We also um, did consider adding solar into this because a lot of the events that we see occur in the winter when solar uh, generation is fairly low anyway, it didn't make much difference to our results. So we sort of focused on demand that wind for simplicity. We identified two events here. So one in September during quite warm conditions and one in the early winter. So the end of November, early December um, during a very sort of cold spell. And I'll go into those in a bit more detail. So if we take the sort of simple differences between, so this is the climatology, which I forgot to explain between 1990 and 2022. If we take the simple differences between the climatology and the absolute values, we can get the anomalies. And this just helps to highlight more clearly the events that were challenging for the energy sector. So we've got a few sort of popping up in early 2023, and we've also got some in early 2024 as well. But the sort of worst demand net wind event, at least from our sort of model data, was at that early winter period. Um, in November, December 2023. And then our sort of only summer event was sort of this spell in September, where there was much lower wind generation than normal. Demand was sort of fairly normal for the time of year, uh, which sort of contributed towards that. Um, the winter event was very typical. Again, I'll go into more detail later with high pressure conditions leading to cold and still conditions. And these sort of pop up in the daily temperature anomalies uh, during 2023. So. Maybe so that's our very warm September event, and then this is our cold winter event. And you can also see these sort of early winter events popping out here. So in January and March. So the first one of these was the September heat wave between the 4th to the 11th of September 2023. So here we had the jet sort of kicked to the north, which allowed high pressure to build across the UK. And somewhere in England, 30 degrees was exceeded uh, each day between the 4th and 10th of September 2023. So really hot conditions, and you can see the warm days in the GIF here, and you can see sort of the still sort of suddenly uh, winds coming through here. So a rapid attribution study done by the Met Office found that these hot events in autumn are becoming much more likely, and that if you sort of looked at whether they would occur in a pre-industrial climate, it's actually very unlikely to see these sort of events. And like I mentioned, um, the sort of primary driver of the anomalously high demand net wind at this time was the low wind power generation, about five to 10 gigawatts lower than normal. It's also expected that summer events like this are potentially likely to become more challenging in the future as more care homes and even residential homes install air conditioning. We're going to get more demand effects related to air conditioning. And so say we had low wind power generation combined with much higher demands because of the warm temperatures that would make an event like this much more challenging. We also have our cold snap event where we've got a fairly typical NEO negative pattern over the Atlantic, high pressure building over Scandinavia, bringing in sort of cold northeasterly winds over the UK. Again, this is a fairly typical sort of winter event leading to high demands and low wind power generation. Um, and there's a question about in the future, will events like this become more challenging as wind power makes up more of our energy mix? So in terms of summarising the supply security section, so I guess our main finding was that the UK power system is resilient. This will be a, a sort of running theme through the report. As we had no serious supply security issues re re requiring uh, widespread outages or backup generation between January 2023 and April 2024, we identified these two high demand net wind events in September and early winter. The September heat wave event was driven by low wind power generation and the winter um, cold snap was driven by, I guess, both demand and wind. And future events we expect are likely to be driven by similar conditions, but with a changing power system, it's hard to say how severe these might be. And obviously there's uncertainty with climate change. We know that winters are likely to become warmer, but there's much more uncertainty um, relating to the dynamics of winter blocking events and how these might change in the future. Which sort of brings me on to my next section, thinking about uh, winter storms. So why do we care about winter storms? We care about winter storms because they impact the distribution network. In the UK, the distribution network looks something like this, where we've got the main sort of transmission line 
which is run by National Grid, which, uh, which is those sort of large pylons which are fairly resilient to damages. Um, but when the sort of at the more regional level, you have well underground cables which are kind of all right, but then you have uh, the poles which are vulnerable to falling over in the winter. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the main issue. So here's just an example from Storm Babbitt of a tree falling. This tree did not fall on a line, but you could imagine that the line was there maybe. Um, you can also have flooding impacting substations. So here's a picture from, I think, the southwest during Storm Kieran. Again, transmission infrastructure, fairly resilient. If you would have had a substation here that might not have been raised, then you could have got into issues there. Um, you can also have issues where successive storms hamper recovery efforts. So this was the case with Aisha and Jocelyn in early 2024. Well, there were these extensive weather warnings for Aisha. Um, Justin wasn't quite as severe, but it just meant that the clear up operation was much more challenging afterwards. So we had two very contrasting storm seasons. So 22, 23 was actually a very quiet storm season with only two storms occurring um, and very late in the season. So right at the end of August, whereas we had a real bumper storm season in 23, 24. So great for writing a report um, with about 12 storms between, um, I guess, September and August of this year. We also had two quite severe storms. So we had Babbitt and Aisha with red weather warnings. And we had two separate instances of storms occurring in quick succession. So Elin and Fergus in December and Aisha and Jocelyn in January. So in terms of how we looked at these storms, uh, we looked at the daily maximum 10 meter wind gusts for the UK. And we also looked at the aggregate precipitation as well. Um, and you can see that different storms sort of pop out with different characteristics. Babbitt, there were lots of issues with rain. Kieran was more winds, but because it was sort of diverted to the south, we don't actually see sort of the worst of the winds if we just aggregate over the GB landmass. You've got Elin and Fergus occurring in quick succession there. Same with Aisha and Jocelyn, really bad winds during Aisha. And then during the sort of Christmas period, we had Pia and Gerrit. Uh, Pia having more of a sort of windstorm type impact and Gerrit having more issues uh, with rainfall. And then there's the names of all the storms there. Cool. Another way that we looked at the more regional impacts is by looking at storm and precipitation footprints. So these wind footprints are the maximum um, 10 meter wind gust within a 72 hour period centered on the storm date. Um, so you can see some of them that I'm going to explore today. So Aisha and Jocelyn, very severe winds. I think because these occurred in such quick succession, uh, the 72 hour window around Jocelyn is just picking up the same winds as it did for Aisha. I'll also go into more detail about Babbitt and Kieran. Where, in, where for Babbitt, the impacts were mostly in, in eastern Scotland, whereas Kieran, they were in the Channel Islands and more sort of northern France. And this is quite similar with the precipitation footprints as well. You can see in sort of western, on the western coast, uh, Aisha and Jocelyn were very impactful, whereas for Kieran, it was really in the Channel and particularly eastern Scotland for Babbitt. So Storm Babbitt occurred on the 19th of October 2023. We had the storm moving in from south to north, which is apparently quite unusual. We had these stationary fronts stuck over Scotland, producing lots of heavy rain. So the Met Office put off, uh, put out various um, sort of weather warnings for this region, including one for a uh, red warning for the county of Angus. I think that was a pretty good warning because I think Angus recorded their heaviest ever day of rainfall since 1891. Um, and you can see this in the sort of precipitation anomaly plots. So we have about 200 millimetres of rain occurring in this region in about three days, uh, which is about 200% of the climatology. So yeah, really heavy rain at that time. Again, this is sort of backed up by our storm footprints where really we see the worst of the impacts in eastern Scotland. And this obviously led to outages. So Northern Power Grid, which operates electricity in the northeast of England, I think there are about 40,000 outages there. There were lots of outages in Scotland. I think that was where most of the issues were. Um, and Part of the challenge with this was because there was such heavy rain, it meant that actually accessing um, sort of customers that were offline was quite challenging. Next, we have Storm Kieran, which occurred in early November 2023. There was a lot of uh, sort of media attention for Kieran because it sort of underwent similar development to the Great Storm of 1987. Um, fortunately, the impacts occurred sort of further to the south than the Great Storm, and so a lot of the worst impacts were avoided. Um, but the severity of it can be seen in the shipping forecast from Plymouth, um, suggesting that perhaps hurricane force 12 winds were going to be experienced later, which I think is the worst, the worst category on the Beaufort wind scale. 
you can see the impacts across northern France and the Channel Islands here with wind speeds of over 100 knots. Um, but still, it was pretty bad in the southwest and the south coast of England with wind speeds of over, looks like about 60 knots um, occurring in some regions. Um, this caused outages in the south of England, I think a total of around 150,000 outages. Um, I think schools closed in Devon and there were around 1,000 outages. And then in Surrey, um, trains had to stop and I think there were around 7,000 outages. Finally, uh, storms Aisha and Jocelyn, which occurred in late January 2024. Here you can see Aisha just moving to, across the north of the UK with Jocelyn just waiting in the West Atlantic there. And just a day later, you can see the weather fronts of Jocelyn almost sort of reaching Ireland. For this, well, for Aisha, the, uh, the Met Office put, all, put out quite extensive weather warnings covering much of the UK. I think this was quite unusual because normally orange weather warnings don't cover or amber weather warnings don't cover that much the UK. And you can see the severity of the wind impacts from the footprint here. This brought down power lines with most of the impacts occurring in the Northwest and Northern Ireland. And I think over 300,000 customers were left without power. And this was mainly distributed between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And because of Jocelyn occurring not long after Aisha, it meant that there were real issues with getting people back online and a lot of people were out for much longer than they would have been otherwise. So in terms of a summary of the infrastructure section, again, I think it's important to highlight the resilience of the UK power system. We had a very active storm season. We had some quite severe storms, but we didn't have any widespread sort of national scale outages. Despite this, however, as we've explored, we know that there's some regional outages. So Storm Babette really affected eastern Scotland, Kieran, southern England, and Aisha affected Northern Ireland. And I think it's important to highlight that the impacts of Kieran could have been a lot worse as well, potentially, if there had been sort of slight shifts in the storm track. The frequency of storms caused issues, particularly when they occurred in quick succession. I didn't go into detail about Alin and Fergus here, but it was a similar sort of situation to Aisha and Jocelyn. And it's well, there's a lot of uncertainty with climate change and severe storms, um, sort of like I previously mentioned, but some such studies do suggest that severe wind storms are likely to become more frequent in the UK with climate change, which will potentially cause further impacts for DNOs in the future. So they have to deal with more of these events in a given winter. So what's next? So I think really the main finding from the report is that the UK power system is resilient, which is quite a nice finding to sort of come up with. Um, but we know at the same time that the climate and the power system are both rapidly changing. We're due to experience between an extra one degree to, I think that's about four degrees of warming by 2100, depending on the sort of scenario that's picked. But the landscape of the power system is also changing rapidly as well. So it took us between 2008 and to 2023, so 15 years, to get from three gigawatts of installed capacity of wind power to 30. I think there's currently ambitions to bring this up to 90 gigawatts by 2030, which is a rapid scale of change. I mean, yeah. Whether or not that will occur by 2030, we'll see, but the ambition is there. <laughs> but this is just one aspect of the energy system as well. So National Grid produced these future energy scenarios where they look at the sort of different dimensions of the future power system and how they might project for it to change. So do we move towards hydrogen or do we electrify? How much demand and flexibility is operated? And how much do we sort of continue to include natural gas in the mix? So both things are changing, the climate and the power system. But I think what the difference between the two storm seasons sort of demonstrates is that each year brings very different challenges. We had one storm season that was kind of quite quiet and relatively inactive, and we had another that was incredibly busy with 12 storms, some of which being quite severe. So I think internal variability is definitely plays an important role in this as well. And yeah, I guess one of the main sort of points from this report is that if we want to better anticipate and better sort of understand impacts of the future climate on the future power system, we want to understand the present first and the impacts that that has. So yeah, I guess that's the state of the climate for the UK energy sector report, which we've been working on over the summer. We're hoping to release that in the next two weeks or so. So I think that's a week on Thursday, along with an executive summary document. We have a sort of sign up link to the mailing list here if you want to hear about any future events. Our next future event, which we've got happening, which I'm really looking forward to, is the seasonal forecast outlook for the energy sector. So here we've got Hazel Thornton from the Met Office delivering the winter forecast, followed by Antje Weisheimer from ECNWF, sort of responding to that forecast, identifying common forecast signals. And then we've also got Jan Dutton from the World Climate Service and Lucy Field from AFRI to talk about the implications for the electricity and gas networks.
Um, so yeah, so sign up to the event here and the mailing list there. I think I'll leave that slide up at the end. Thank you all for listening. Do you have any questions? Brilliant, thank you, Ben. Uh, time for some questions. Um, we've got two microphones coming, so please wait for the microphone. I've got two in the middle. I'll take one on the left and then we'll do on the right. Thank you, thank you very much. Alan Yates, Institute of Informatics, uh, Environmental Informatics, University of Reading. Um, would it be worthwhile highlighting curtailment and constraint management actions in your review? Because they're obviously associated with high wind generation days where the systems operator has to curtail. And that's quite a significant feature of the whole system, isn't it? Yeah. So we haven't considered that that much in this report because largely demand is well, it tends to be lower in the summer and more steady. But I think this is something that could increasingly become an issue in the future as we electrify more of the demand. And so, yeah, potentially in the future. Thank you. And then another question just, yeah, coming the other way. <laughs> so thanks again for the, the great presentation. Uh, just a question on um, uh, the power outages. Are these visible on the demand curves? Do they have an impact? Do they have a footprint? Um, so we haven't really looked so much at the direct sort of demand data or I guess the power curves. The way that we've inferred impacts is from the modeled energy data. So really we're just identifying events where wind power generation relative to demand is sort of lower than we might expect. Um, so yeah, I think perhaps in the future, I think it would be good to validate our sort of modeled data against the observed data sets to make sure that we're sort of capturing the same kind of events. But we did consult with people at ESO previous to this, and they did say that the September event and the November event were quite unusual and did stand out in their records. And a similar question actually around data, because obviously there's a lot of data here from models, and um, but actual data coming from, say, the wind farms themselves, um, you know, is, is it possible to use those mm. as part of the analysis, but also verification, I guess? Yeah, so the challenge is with, I guess, modelling these sort of, yeah, power systems is that the power system is continually changing and there's new wind farms being installed each year. Mm -hmm. So if we were to use the data from them, we'd have to sort of account for the fact that the system's changing. Yeah. So what Hannah does when she creates these energy reanalysis data sets is she considers a static energy system, yeah. a sort of best approximation of what the 2023 energy system looks like to kind of try and set that um, in a historical context, because otherwise it's quite hard to relate to sort of past changes. changes. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Take another question here. Thanks, sir. really interesting. So you, you presented some data on the demand net renewables, but for the faults, you told us you had data, but then you only showed us headlines from newspapers. Yeah. Is there something to say about the, the quality or the usefulness of that data, perhaps? Why you didn't show it? Yeah, so I think part of the um, part of the agreement in receiving fault data is that there were complications with using it and sort of publishing the final output in the reports, because obviously these are sort of private companies who maybe don't want to necessarily be seen as sort of really suffering with winter storms. So we did have, yeah, like I mentioned, fault data from Northern Power Grid and Electricity Northwest. And that was really interesting for looking at sort of which storms in the winter caused the worst impacts in which areas. The data actually isn't bad in terms of the categorization of um, sort of which, uh, what hazards caused um, which faults. Um, but I think if we had greater spatial coverage, I think that would be that would be really useful. So I think that would be our goal for next year if we were to sort of write the same report, because then we could really highlight, well, we saw in southern England a sort of X percentage increase in weather related faults during Storm Kieran potentially. But obviously this didn't really occur in northern England. But with sort of just two two regions, it was quite hard to sort of yeah evaluate that. Question from the front. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you, um, sorry, it's Mark Rodwell from UCMWF. Um, you showed that situation uh, in the uh, winter where we had high demand and uh, uh, low supply, sort of sort of blocking sort of situation, I guess, over mm. Europe. Uh, those kind of events can be very difficult to predict, actually. Mm. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, whether you had an idea about how well it was predicted, you know, what lead time and sort of what what took up the the deficit 
of energy? Was there time to turn on gas or, or mm. what, what? What? How? How did that work out? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the predictability. We haven't really looked into that in much detail. I mean, as a meteorologist from an academic standpoint, that's really interesting. Um, but in terms of um, sort of the second part of your question and in, in terms of what came online, I think when we were speaking to our contacts at ESO, I think they rely quite a lot on interconnectors because um, if an event is affecting us in the UK, the impacts might not be so severe in France or Denmark or the Netherlands potentially. So I think that's something that we rely on, um, particularly the French nuclear capacity as well, because obviously that's kind of um, fairly stable regardless of weather or climate. Um, but I'm not sure about the exact sort of balancing actions that were taken for that event. Great. OK, thank you, Ben. So we move on to uh, the second presentation this afternoon, and I'd like to invite Emily Wallace uh, from the Met Office. Um, Emily uh, is uh, the first person to hold the role of fellow in weather and climate extremes at the Met Office. Um, and has over a decades of experience uh, delivering innovative services to the energy sector. Uh, I also want to mention she's a chartered meteorologist. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I was going to mention the um, I, I've come from more of a climate service background than a meteorology background, and uh, it, it was pointed out to me recently that CMET is available and you know is welcoming applications from people who look like me. Uh, so if there's any other people who look like me in the audience, then uh, then do consider applying. It's not very onerous and obviously lovely to to be associated with the with the group. So yes, I'm Emily Wallace. I've been working in the energy sector for some time in at, at the Met Office. I'm currently in a, um, an, in a role focusing particularly on extremes, so recognising that climate change is upon us and we're already experiencing climate change related extreme weather, so things we've never seen before. And recognising that the, the way we need to deal with that is different to how we may have de dealt with it in the past. So I suspect a lot of people in the room are um, weather and climate experts. Traditionally, we've split split those disciplines quite a lot. So you're either a weather expert or a climate expert. The extremes team is, a, is about joining those disciplines, so taking a more seamless approach. And I'll sort of play that out a little bit, uh, thinking about last winter through this talk, um, and also bringing in some of the other disciplines that are really critical to making good decisions when um, when we're experiencing extreme weather. And one in particular is around social sciences. So uh, we've got operational meteorologists, climate experts, and social science expertise within the team. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, this presentation is, is uh, drawing on work from across the office. We've got an energy uh, consultancy applied science team, Paula Gonzalez in the uh, in the room here. Um, do talk to her because I'm going to have to dash off quite quickly after I've spoken. So if you've got any energy Met Office questions, Paula there gives away. Um, is available to take questions. I've just set her up to that just then, and other uh, other other people in uh, in the in the office have contributed to this. So the Met Office. This is why the Met Office is involved in energy um, at all. Uh, but we've been involved in, met in in energy for a long time. But really, we've got to sharpened our focus with the entry of the new government uh, delivery of um, clean power by 2030, this really high priority. It's one of the five missions of, of our current government, um, which really focuses the Met Office's attention on the sector. Um, so, as I say, we've been delivering into this area for a long time. What, what the Met Office is about is delivering, uh, is supporting government priorities, and, and that often means working with industry in order to do that. So working with industry, working with academia um, in, in collaboration, um, and uh, supporting uh, good decision making. So the sorts of areas we're working in, um, I'm going to talk mainly about forecasting today, but actually when we're thinking about energy, uh, we're, we're thinking, when we're thinking about clean energy, we're thinking about a system that's far more reliant on weather and climate than it has traditionally been. Um, the, there's energy, uh, there's weather and climate um, sensitivities throughout the, the sort of operation, the planning, the build, um, and and into the into the future operations. So these are the kind of areas that the Met Office is working on at the moment. So better decisions now. That's both in terms of optimising um, how how uh, energy is managed day to day, but also the resilience of the network. So the two areas that uh, Ben's been talking about, evidence based plans. So we've done a lot of work with the likes of the National Infrastructure Commission um, and uh, ESO 
thinking about well what what possible futures can there be for our energy system what technologies would work um, and how and how how would that look in terms of their cost their carbon etc cost effective build is a really interesting one um so thinking about the clean energy that we're trying we need to get off the off the north sea so we've got wind farms in the north sea we need to get that energy into the uk and used that takes a lot of transmission infrastructure that transmission infrastructure is building to um, building standards that are often quite old. So it's using historic climate, it's using old science. Met Office is working with uh, transmissions uh, um, operators to, to um, optimise what they're building to, which means that we can reduce the cost of the build and we can reduce the carbon associated with that build. So really critical areas for actually facilitating clean energy in the UK. One of the ones I'm really interested in at the moment and interested particularly if there's any academic or, or industry partners working on this at the moment is the future operation. So if say we plan this, uh, a, a, or we will plan a, a, a effective um, future energy system, low carbon. One of the really interesting questions, and we've worked a little bit with the Royal Society on this, is what's the opt how, how do you optimise the operation of that system? Um, so I've, I've got some projects with Strathclyde University who are looking at this, digital twins of the future energy system and how that will operate. When do you decide to store? When do you decide to um, to flex demand in order to operate the, the system effectively, efficiently, low carbon, etc. So those are the sorts of areas we're looking in. So say I'm going to focus mostly on the forecasting timescales here, but um, th there's such a lot of interesting work in this area, as I'm sure most of you are aware if you're already in the sector. Skip on a couple. So thinking about last season, this this uh, particular plot, Ben had the up to date one actually with Lillian on the on, on the right hand side there. Um, but if you ask Joe Public what last winter was like, they would say stormy or they'd probably say wet. Um, and it was indeed we had 11 named storms within what I would call the extended winter season. So the sort of the, the bit of the energy uh, of the season that um, the, the year that the energy sector would probably focus on in terms of um, uh, the generation and also the um, resilience. So it was stormy, it was wet, but it was also had very rapid changes in the sort of conditions that we were experiencing. So if you look at the um, time series of temperature on the top there, coming from September to November, um, that's temperature on the top, precipitation on the bottom. We had these really rapid switching from warm conditions to cold. So that the one that Ben pointed out on the right hand side there in end of November is, is just showing up. And similarly, um, around um, January as well, another switch to very uh, much colder conditions, drier conditions. So the, the system was coming to cope with not just stormy, wet, windy conditions, but then this rapid flip to, to cold conditions, which for a lot of sectors can be quite challenging. So if I sort of play those out, we had the record heat towards the beginning of the season, extreme rainfall, unusual heat again. Um, whilst uh, just before Babette, there was extreme wet rainfall on the west of Scotland at the same time as I was swimming in the sea in, in Devon. Um, it's quite unusual conditions for early October. Cold snap, yeah, end of November, um, and another one in January. So the, the sort of exam question I felt I was coming with today was around the seasonal forecast. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you the seasonal forecast that we made for the December to February period and then talk through how successful that was. Now, often my colleagues, particularly in the seasonal team, would be comparing the mean sea level charts and seeing how well did that do. And that's part of the that's part of the answer to that question. Um, and actually, the mean sea level charts look very, very similar from the for the forecast to the to what happened. But actually, what I'd like to look at in a bit more detail is is the what the season forecast, what the heads up it gave to the to the sector um, and, and, and how that played out. So here it is. Um, I don't know if you all remembered seeing this. I'm sure you check it out on the first day of release. The top line is showing what the season forecast for December to February was in terms of temperature. The middle one's precipitation and the bottom one's wind speed. So effectively, it, what it spotted, um, if you like, was that we were most likely to get this the wet, mild um, season. So it was a, a El Nino year, which often means you start the season with wet, windy, mild, and then more likely to go colder towards the end of the season. And that's what this forecast was calling out. So from the face of it, in terms of the sorts of things that the energy traders would have been looking at at the beginning of the season, we know this forecast does move the market in terms of energy prices. Um, 
it, it gave a pretty good steer to the to the sort of season we're expecting. So in that sense, that, that went pretty well. The other thing it did in terms of calling out that we might be looking out for colder conditions at some point during the season, what it helped us do was to open up the conversation with, for example, our government customers to, to start the conversation a little bit earlier ahead of those cold snaps to help them lead them into the story of the cold snaps, but the expectation that, yes, you've hit, you've been hit by four storms already, but actually the cold snap could still happen. So that, that was a really um, useful feature. And of course, in terms of the, the overall forecast for wet and windy, it helped to tee up the resilience teams. They then showed a lot of pictures of the, the sorts of storms warnings that we had through the winter. Again, really, really helpful um, tee up for, for those conversations. So the, the forecast itself um, was you know, objectively good, if you like. But what the other thing that it does is really open up those conversations, like seamless conversation through the winter with our um, where we're briefing into government, briefing into industry to help continue that story of, of, of how the season played out. So I'm going to focus now on a trial service um, that, that we ran over the winter um, that focuses particularly on the use of uncertainty. So again, it's part of that storytelling through the season um, as we come up to different events. Uh, so the, the, the particular trial folks focused on, on uncertainty and, and where that matters to the energy sector. Um, I think it's a really nice example of how working as meteorologists alongside our, our customers can be really helpful for getting that extra edge, that extra bit of value off, off a straightforward forecast. So wind generation um, has some uh, areas of sensitivity to uncertainty. So this is a map of the UK with the current and future uh, wind farms marked on it. So the biggest one at the moment is Hornsea sitting on the in the North Sea there, um, and we're expecting Dogger Bank to be produced um, uh, to, to come online in 2026. So when when we're issuing our data to to um, to, to wind farm operators to ESO, for example, the areas that really really matter, the really critical areas, um, are off the North Sea. In these areas. So if, if there's uncertainty in those areas, that matters much more than if there's uncertainty anywhere else in the UK. And something similar is true in terms of the wind speed. So probably everyone in the room is familiar with the power output curve. Um, get my pointer showing. Does that show? No, you have to use your imagination. Oh, yes. no, thank you. So here's the rated wind speed along the bottom and the amount of power output uh, along the y-axis. So if we've got uncertainty in a forecast, uncertainty in the forecast of a few meters per second here doesn't matter that much. Uncertainty up here matters an awful lot. And uncertainty in this area also matters quite a lot. So what our operational meteorologists were able to do over this winter in conversation with customers is to highlight when we have uncertainty in our forecast that it was in either the geographical areas that are really critical or in the wind speeds that were really critical. And again, this, this meant that this collaboration, this sort of conversational way of is, issuing a forecast means that you can get much greater value out of, uh, out of the forecast than you could just a, a, a sort of static data feed. I've got one nice example um, of that here. This is a, a period in, in February where the operational meteorologist spotted that the, the shorter lead time forecasts were starting to reduce the wind in this really critical area. And they were able to highlight this to, to the, the um, trial, uh, the folks at the other end of the trial, um, who, who could then take action on this, on this actually what was going to be a reduced output compared to what their data forecasts were telling them. So it's a really excellent um, example of uh, where that sort of conversational aspect of a forecast is really critical. So I felt like I couldn't finish without talking about next winter. Um, it's it's a little bit early to be talking in in very um, strong terms about next winter. Um, ben advertised the uh, the talk that's coming up on the 28th of November, where Hazel will hopefully be able to do a bit more of a big reveal on on what the Met Office forecast is going to be for that period. Until then, I'm afraid it's it's relatively bland lines. It looks like the um, the La Nina is developing. The forecasts are, are getting more confident for a La Nina developing, uh, which obviously will have some impact on on the um, outcome for the winter. But at the moment, the the, the sort of um, the outcome of that uh, and so is 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 still in the balance. Um, so the current signals are, are, are modest um, at this this stage. We're not uh, suggesting any different uh, likelihood to, to normal. 
Um, and in terms of the sort of flood risk, it's going to be very much based on, on what we've already seen uh, from the from the autumn into winter period. And um, so just to, to really highlight that point I made earlier about the, the seamlessness, this is just a starting point. You're going to get an update in November from Hazel and, and the crew. And the, the really important thing is to have that as the beginning of a conversation, beginning of the, the story as to how the winter plays out. Um, so keep up to date seasonal forecast here or with the um, the Royal Met Sox meeting um, and the uh, experts like Paula on the end of the line on our uh, energy mailing list as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. Yep, one at the back. Um, yeah, I was, I was just wondering a little bit about the um, sort of profile of the users of the seasonal forecast in the energy sector. Is, is it mainly um, speculators on the futures market or, or are there things that the network operators can do usefully with forec forecasts of that sort of long lead time? So certainly energy traders are looking at it. Um, I've spoken to those who who, who have done, um, they're, um, they're certainly a, a, a user of it. The other groups, are, yeah, it's opening the conversation to the resilience community really. So we, we put out the forecast and particularly aspects like, well, actually, you know, there are there is the possibility of cold snaps. We're keeping an eye on what the NGO is doing. The, the likelihood of the cold snap is increasing. That, that, that conversation is, is sort of really what for me it, it leads to um the likes of um national grid also take this sort of forecast into account when they're doing their winter outlook they don't they don't at the moment um change the outlook sort of uh, materially as a result of the forecast but it is really very much part of their thinking when they're going into to a winter what you know what what are the likely outcomes uh, what are the risks i think that's that's where it's really 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 valuable is what what are, what are the problems that could occur. Yeah. I guess we've got some users of the seasonal yeah. forecast in the room, so it might be worth asking anybody who, um, you know, takes that seasonal forecast and, and you know, how you use it, if anybody's willing to kind of share that information. Is it is it useful? Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, the at the end, we are looking uh, an average outcome of those are those different, yeah. And uh, well, if we have a deep cold snap, but then it's very warm up, then what is short big cold. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the single event, um, can we, for example, we all allow a hydro power production, that solid thing. Mm -hmm. So the thing definitely very useful if you look at that seasonal forecast from last winter you know it did extremely well it did it did yeah with hindsight you can kind of pick out that that signal coming of a you know wet and windy season but with some kind of mm. colder snaps in there but I guess hindsight's a wonderful thing in a sense. It's getting that information across because it's quite a simple, very useful graphic that you get, but it's quite simple. And I guess that's the work that you do in expanding on that information and working with the customers throughout the season, not just, you know, we give this at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a few more questions. So I'll take one from Hillary and then we'll come to... Thank you. Um, you said that the rapid switching from warm to cold was very challenging. Can you explain why? Uh, I particularly had in mind uh, train operators when I said that. I had, hadn't heard the, 
that is a story from energy operators, although it may be that some of the um, problems are similar. So for um, rail operators, that rapid switch can be a, a change of the kit that they have to have on their trains in order to clear the leaves or clear the ice. Um, whether or not that's also true of uh, energy operators, I think, I think one of the challenges is as humans, you get used to the status quo and then when it switches abruptly, actually as a human, that could be quite challenging. Um, for the system, it's, it's probably not such a physical problem. Um, unless anyone else has other experiences, I'd be interested. Okay, there's a question here, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Jethro Brown, University of Glasgow. Um, it's really great to hear, um, hear you talk about predictability and operability of future energy systems. I think historically, when we've thought about future energy systems, it's been more about balance of supply and demand than just variability. Are you starting to have more conversations about predictability and the ability to operate a system under kind of the uncertainty of short term forecasts? Is that? That, that's what I'm, I'm really interested in getting more involved in. So um, it was it was mentioned in the Royal Society hydrogen paper last year. Um, there's a you may be aware of that actually the um, Strathclyde University have a digital twin project which is starting to look at how how those different vectors of the energy system will interact. And one of the things I'd I'd love them to be picking up in that is is putting in forecasts and see, you know what is the optimal way to operate this this future system in the sense of you know experts in how those things operate which is not the met office which is why i'm so keen for um really deep collaboration in this area um so yeah if that's a, if that's another interest of yours then let's let's have a chat any more questions so just to let you know emily will not be here for the q a at the end and she has to leave you in the coffee break so now is your time if you have a question for emily Yes. Thank you. Uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, you know, one of the issues with power is actually the interconnectors. And you know, when you cross a border from England into Scotland, you suddenly realise the number of turbines that are there is, is vast compared with what's on the southern side of the band of the border. Um, but the interconnectors between Scotland and England are not very efficient. There are not enough of them, as far as I understand it, you know, so you get paid to turn your turbine off, actually, uh, because the power is there in Scotland, it's producing more than it needs. England is not, but there's no way of, well, there are some ways, but in insufficient ways of taking that power from Scotland to England. Do you feature that in your analysis in some ways when you're making forecasts you, you might know in advance well these guys they can produce the power but we can't use it so that that would be yeah it's a, it's a great question uh, so that would be why we're working in close collaboration with the organizations that have to deal with that problem so that at the met office we're providing the information the insights in terms of the uh, the modeling of the system that's almost exclusively done by by the um either industry, government, academia itself. So what we have encouraged for a number of years is to really take account of the spatial variability of the forecast, the spatial um, extent of the, the forecast. So the sort of um, issues I was describing earlier with, you know, if you've got uncertainty here, it doesn't matter that much. If you've got uncertainty here, it really does. Um, that That's where the Met Office will be um, focusing and uh, understanding the uncertainty, the probability associated with a forecast. So if taking into account those factors means that, yes, a, an organisation could take better account of when you've got a, um, a, a constraint from, from having too much generation in Scotland compared to where the demand is. I guess that target of 2030 for clean energy, the, mm. these are the things that need sorting out, in a sense, uh, alongside, you know, uh, more wind power, uh, more solar power as well. It's the transmission that's yeah. just as vital. Um, I have a question which is probably a bit unfair. It probably goes to, to anybody in the room, but we, we've kind of nationalising the power system and kind of going to GB Energy. Do you see that being kind of useful? Um, in a sense, you, you're kind of dealing with one body across the whole of the UK. <laughs> so we'll, we'll certainly be looking to collaborate with whichever organisations are um, responsible for getting those government priorities delivered and um, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Okay. Yes, please. Can I just pass the mic so that we could pick it up? Sorry. Thanks. So as well as University of Glasgow, I have an affiliation with National Grid ESO, which is being nationalised. The branding is changing next Tuesday, in fact, to the uh, National Energy System Operator. So we're taking on a role for gas as well as electricity. But we're, we're already um, knocking on the doors of organisations who previously there was a a barrier to working with and especially with regards to data sharing yep. um so i i foresee that will like uh grease some wheels yeah. uh certainly um between the system operator and other uh government organizations including the met office including so, the yeah. met office who, yeah very, very uh, um, active plans of uh for the partnership with the uh, national Energy system mm -hmm. operator Oh, sorry. OK, yeah, sorry. Any more questions? So I think Emily's around for maybe five or ten minutes during the coffee break, if you do want to catch her. Um, we're back roughly on track time wise. Um, so if I can get you back in here just just after three o'clock, we'll get going and then we're just a couple of minutes behind. So tea and coffee is just outside uh, in the kind of entrance area at the top. Um, yeah, back in here just after three o'clock, please. OK, thank you for coming back promptly. Um, so we have two more talks and then a QA. and a um, So I'm delighted to uh, welcome our third speaker this afternoon, Chris Bell. Chris is the Chief Communications Officer and Senior Meteorologist at WeatherQuest, which is based in Norwich. Um, he has over 20 years experience in forecasting and helps lead the WeatherQuest uh, operational forecasting team in delivering high quality data streams, including forecasts for clients working in the offshore renewable sector. Over to you. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thank you to the RMAT SARC for inviting me to speak to, to you guys. Um, my talk's going to be a little bit different than um, what you've heard so far. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more focused in on um, the offshore wind industry, um, but particularly from the point of view of their operations uh, on a day to day basis and how the weather affects what they do when it comes to the construction uh, and O&M phases of the wind farm. So not looking necessarily too far in advance, but I do have a couple of things to say about that as well. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about WeatherQuest, um, we are a private weather forecasting company based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Um, been around since about 2001. Um, early in the days of WeatherQuest, worked a lot with agriculture and media, um, but over the last 10 or 15 years, have started doing a lot more work for uh, the energy sector, um, contracts um, with uh, some of the big players who are building the offshore wind farms around the UK. So we have services that we provide for quite a few of the wind, uh, wind farms in the North Sea, uh, some in the Irish Sea, uh, in the English Channel, and even a few over off the coast of Sweden as well. So um, so we've been working with these guys for, for about a decade now and uh, kind of listening to what affects them on a daily basis as far as getting out and accessing the turbines and, and doing the, the maintenance that they do. So basically, um, I've kind of said what, um, what the slide shows there, but we kind of work with our clients um, all the way from the sort of pre-construction phase of a wind farm all the way to the operations and maintenance phase of the wind farm. And then potentially in the next decade or so, there'll be a couple of wind farms that may get decommissioned and it'll be in that sort of phase as well. So, um, so some of the wind farms are coming up to the end of their life cycle already um, uh, around the UK. And I just also wanted to kind of highlight as well that um, uh, from a WeatherQuest forecasting perspective for our clients, the people that we work for are the top priority. So it's all about maintaining health and safety, making sure that these guys who are going from the coast, working offshore, they get there and they come back safely. Because obviously for them to be able to deliver the power that we have to deliver to the networks, um, the people have to make sure that it keeps running. Um, so that is the kind of most important thing that we're we're thinking about on a daily basis. So we don't get into the um, forecasting perspective in terms of how much energy is going to be produced at a wind farm. We are more about forecasting how that's going to affect them going off and, and, and doing the things they need to do on the wind farm. So I thought I would kind of structure this talk in, uh, in a way that kind of gives you an idea of who the 
key people are on a wind farm that are using weather data um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, have any of you in the audience um, uh, worked at a wind farm um, and been offshore and done that sort of thing? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, there's been one, one or two people. So apologies that some of this will be uh, uh, fairly common sense um, there, but I just wanted to kind of highlight our role and how we disseminate this information and, and how they use that to make decisions. So obviously, uh, the forecaster in this case, um, from my perspective, it's uh, my WeatherQuest forecast team um, who are uh, disseminating our weather uh, forecasts uh, to the various wind farms. Our main point of contact on a wind farm is the marine coordinator. Um, so the marine coordinator um, is basically um, almost, you can think of them like the uh, an air traffic control person for the wind farm. So they are responsible for all the activities that are going on in the wind farm area in terms of who's out on what boats, what kind of certificates they have, what kind of work they're going to be doing, keeping up with fishing boats that might be in the wind farm area because many wind farms have fishing boats that are all around the turbines as well. So they're making sure that all the traffic through the wind farm uh, is being maintained and that everyone is is being safe. So they're our main point of contact. That's who receives our forecast information uh, on a daily basis. And then it's up to them in the mornings or in the afternoon before to think about how that might affect the plans that they have for the following day or, or the coming day. Um, so if there's various risk of, of weather being outside of limits, then they will talk to the teams who are going offshore and and maybe even call it off for the day right there based on the weather forecast and hopefully they will have known that was coming for a few days if uh, you know if if the computer models have been uh, consistent and we've done our job properly at weatherquest so the second line is um, the vessel captains so um, many of these wind farms operate um, either CTVs, um, crew transfer vehicles, or SOVs, which are the bigger boats that will sit on nowadays the wind farms that are being built further off the coast have very large vessels and they'll sit out for a couple of weeks and then they'll do a changeover so people actually stay out on the boat um, for, for a week or two at a time. Um, so basically the vessel captains are responsible for the final call. So doesn't really matter what the weather forecast says if the vessel captain gets out there and decides that it's unsafe to transfer um, and the people can't access the turbines then they won't do it um, but obviously there's a, a communication that goes on between the marine coordinator and the vessel captains to to make those decisions um, and then you have all the the people who are getting off the boat and going on to the turbines so the engineers and the technicians that are working out there they obviously need to have some understanding of how the weather might evolve through the course of that day uh, and, and how that might affect their operations. And particularly, and I'll speak about it a little bit more in, in a minute or two, um, they're particularly interested in lightning, usually those guys are. So obviously in the summertime, and well, even in winter events, as you all know, um, you know, winter lightning offshore is, you know, is an issue as well. Um, they need to be able to access any information that might come in in real time. So a lot of times, most of these wind farms will have some sort of Wi-Fi capability offshore, and we have WhatsApp messagings that we can um, that we can provide for the for, for those guys so that they can get lightning alerts and, and various messages through. Um, and then something that I'll probably talk about for a couple of minutes uh, at the very end is that there's also the planning team sitting behind all of this. So the for the, the marine coordinators, vessel captain, engineers, realistically, they're mostly interested in the weather today and tomorrow. They really don't care much about what's going on beyond that. They just want to know how their day-to-day -day operation is going to be affected for the next two or three days. But there is a whole team behind them working at each of these wind farms who are actually thinking about the longer term uh, things that they're going to do. So most wind farms will have a routine maintenance program that they carry out through the course of the year. Um, and a lot of that's done in the summertime when the weather is a bit calmer. Um, and then they, in the wintertime, will basically um, fault uh, fine. So if they've got you know, a fault on the wind farm, then they still have to go out and do things and get that done. But most of the routine maintenance stuff happens in the summer. So when it comes to that, the planning team Maybe they need to get a jack-up vessel from somewhere um, and they're going to hire it to come onto the wind farm for a couple of weeks uh, in the summertime. Now, 
if they can see that the forecast in the the you know that the ECMW monthly forecast is suggesting it's going to be an unsettled period of weather and it's going to be windy and changeable conditions, then they might delay the 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 renting of that particular vessel uh, to come to the wind farm, or they might at least be able to plan that. Um, that that isn't going to happen when they hoped it would happen and how that might affect the rest of their operations. So there's that kind of side of things as well. Um, but before I kind of talk a little bit more about um, how they use this information, I thought it would be interesting to kind of uh, show you a little bit about um, what is going on on a wind farm. So um, the pictures on the screen here are ones that I've taken um, when we uh, were fortunate enough to get taken out on a CTV and, and, and look around at a wind farm. And it just gives you an idea of kind of what's going on. So in the bottom left hand side there, you've got um, a CTV, uh, the vessel captains, they'll, these boats have various uh, number of people that can fit on them. But let's say there's a dozen crew that can, um, that, that can go on the boat, um, a dozen technicians could go on the boat. Um, they will drive these CTVs up to the wind turbine. They will push on to the turbine. So you can see the bottom right hand corner here. There's a, a little um, buffer that pushes on to the base of the turbine. And then there are stairs that they will climb up and, and step onto the turbine and then access the turbine that way. So that's the, the process that has to happen. Um, now, we're talking a lot about sort of atmospheric forecasting, but obviously a lot of this um, forecasting that they're interested in uh, on a day-to-day -day basis at a wind farm is also wave forecasting as well. So weather quest are ingesting models um, from many organizations that, that do wave forecasting as well as atmospheric forecasting. And so if these uh, waves are above a certain limit, um, then it becomes unsafe for them to climb off the stairs onto the turbine and go up into the turbine. So I'm going to try to see if I can show you a couple of YouTube videos. I think we've already got them loaded, so I'm going to have a go at um, minimizing the, uh, the the presentation here for a second and see if I can play this out. Uh, so the first one is a, the CTV transfer. I'm just going to back it up just a very touch so that you can kind of see what this looks like. So this is just to show you what this process looks like um, in a relatively calm, benign day. But you've got an engineer up there who's on a ladder and the boat's shaking all around um, and they have to get down the ladder and, and get onto the uh, onto the boat. So that's a, a very quick sort of um, uh, video just to kind of show you that process. Um, another thing that they do uh, routinely, if I just stop this video, So part of their routine maintenance program here is to get on the turbine itself and hang from ropes um, to inspect the blades or to repaint them or to, to do general maintenance to the blades as well. So you've got guys who are hanging from ropes off of turbine blades, uh, uh, hopefully in the summertime in very benign conditions uh, and, and doing some work. These aren't my videos. Um, uh, I, I've never been up there and I never will be. <laughs> Um, they go through a lot of training, but it's amazing talking to them because they, uh, the guys who do it routinely, it, it is just a routine job for them. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's crazy that they go up there and spend hours on a, on a turbine during the day, just hanging from ropes. Um, so let me get this back into the show here. So just to say a little bit about, is that, that working on the teams and everything as well now? Um, so just to say a little bit about, um, things that cause them issues. Um, and so for the guys who are doing the crew transfers um, and stepping off of the boat onto the turbine, obviously the significant wave height is really important. And we had the the, the uh, slide earlier showing the power curve on a wind uh, on a wind turbine and how you know Emily was saying that you know if it's in the kind of low end or the very high end of the of the power curve, then you know if you're off a little bit with your forecast, it's not really that big of a deal. It's very similar for for crew transfer. So these boats are rated at a certain limit for being able to transfer a crew onto a turbine. So if the weather forecast is suggesting the significant wave height is going to be half a meter, 
then that's fine. It doesn't matter if we're off by 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 of a meter in that case. If it's 0 0.8 or 0 0.2, they can still transfer. Similarly, if you're on the other end of the scale and the seas are three meters and you're off, your forecast says it's 2.8 or 3.4 or whatever, then it's out of limits. They're not going to be transferring there either. But there is a zone generally between about 1.2 meters and 1.8 meters where these crew transfer vehicles have their limits. And so if you're off by 0.1 of a meter, that could cost them being able to access um, the, the turbine. And so wind farms that are, you know, uh, say 40 kilometers off the coast, you spend an hour and a half on a vessel going out to the turbine, you get out there, the forecast is off by 0.2, you can't access, you've just driven out there and back and wasted a whole bunch of diesel fuel and a whole bunch of people's time, and it's very costly to the wind farm. So being able to accurately forecast what those wave heights are going to be, um, it, it allows them to be much more productive on the wind farm. So from a rope access perspective, um, the, the thing that kind of really affects those guys is how long it takes to set up. So they'll get out there, um, uh, in a morning, as I say, normally in the summertime, whenever the conditions are a bit more benign. But let's say there's a very small risk of an isolated shower that could produce some lightning in the afternoon. They have to make that decision if they're doing rope access. If that is a 10% risk, do they still go out and do that work? Um, there are many days, especially if you have a sort of southwesterly flow and you're going to get showers popping up over East Anglia and they're going to drift offshore. Um, you know, are those going to produce a few sporadic lightning strikes? And if they are, then are people going to be on the ropes and how quickly can we get them down? Uh, how much lead time are we going to have? Are these showers going to generate? over the land and we're going to see them moving towards us or are they going to pop up right off the coast and, and move out over the wind farm very quickly. So those are the kinds of conversations that our forecasters are having with these guys on a day to day basis to try to give them some insight as to how risky it would be to go and do something like rope access, which takes a long time to set up and, and to get people back down. Now, luckily, as probably most of you know, on a wind turbine, um, there's either a set of stairs or, or a lift inside them, um, and there are safe zones within the turbine. So if you did get caught out in a lightning storm um, at, on a wind turbine, there is an area that these guys can go and technically be safe, but I would rather not want to be in the middle of a, a metal column uh, with a lightning strike on the turbine. So, um, so we try to make sure that they have plenty of notice uh, of what that is. So there's plenty of time to get people down onto the boats and 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 heading back to the to the shore. So, we provide our services to to um, people through online portals. They have live access to weather data. Um, these marine coordinators, lots of them are old school. They still like to get a, a PDF that they can set in front of them, but obviously that PDF is only valid for whenever it's sent in the email. So you have to encourage them to make sure they're keeping up with all the latest information. Um, but in terms of how we kind of manage their forecast, um, Th this will be, you know, not news to, to most of you sitting in this room, but um, companies like WeatherQuest and, and the Met Office and anyone who's sending a weather forecast, it's become a very multi-layered approach in order from us to get raw data from a computer model uh, compared to what our forecaster or our clients see as a forecast. So uh, raw model data comes in, we post post that process that and do some machine learning on that uh, when it comes to wave variables, wind variables, lightning. I've got a slide or two in that as well. Um, that will be post-processed using historical data from the wind farm itself. So it's customer specific. So if they have a wave radar or a wave buoy, um, we're going to be ingesting as much data as we possibly can from all of their systems that they have. Frustratingly, there are some wind farms that don't have that data. So we use maybe nearby wave buoys that are available, uh, or in some cases, we just don't, we aren't able to do that process if, uh, if there's no data available. Um, and then if we have access to their live observations, we will take those and we will compare it to that post-process forecast uh, and we will make some adjustments. So we will basically now cast for the next few hours in order to, um, uh, to kind of improve the forecast further. And at WeatherQuest, we still have the ability to go in and actually as a forecaster manually change the number. We would not normally do this because 
it's usually the case that as a forecaster, you're not going to improve those other steps that are below it. But there will be times when things are going wrong. And in particular, if you're around one of those thresholds and they're not able to access and you can see that they're um, there, if if maybe there's not a, a, a live observation coming in, you can see that things aren't aren't going quite to plan. We go in and, and have the ability to kind of edit forecast manually for them. And then that's what they see. Basically, they see that multi layered approach to uh, to our forecasts. So um, I'm going to kind of skip through um, a bit of this stuff, but obviously. Um, from the perspective of kind of making decisions on a wind farm, they're looking at all of this data. Uh, and again, as I say, they're most interested in what's going on in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours. Um, but these planning teams are, are looking out uh, longer in advance from that perspective. And we're also doing things that give specific tasks that are happening on the wind farm their own risk dashboard so you might be doing something that works on the nacelle or blade installation um, you might be uh, using uh, a jack up vessel to do something and so each of those vessels will have different limits for the activities that they are that they're doing and we will give them heads up on what weather thresholds may be keeping them from doing work over the, the coming few days so that they can still perhaps do something offshore. So to kind of finish this off, um, I just wanted to kind of highlight what weather variables actually cause them the most issue. Um, so this part probably isn't terribly surprising, but when you speak to a marine coordinator or one of the engineers on the wind farm, those things that are on the left hand side tend to be all they care about. Um, they don't care that much about rainfall um, uh, if and unless they've got the uh, the, uh, the the turbine engine open and they want to keep it dry um, it doesn't really matter if it's raining offshore to those guys um, so they're interested in um, whether or not the winds are going to be too strong um, so if they're up high on a uh, platform on the top of the turbine they don't want to be at risk of being blown blown over um, up there so they typically have uh, limits of about 15 to 18 meters per second that they can work in. The other side of that from an operation and maintenance standpoint is that you also don't really want to take your wind turbine down for routine operations and maintenance if it's producing optimal power. So that's another th thought process that's going into the short term two or day, two or three day planning on what's going on. Um, you know, are are they going to be wanting to continue to produce optimal power through that period? And that might adjust their their routine maintenance plans from that perspective. Um, rough seas, I've already mentioned sort of that you know, 1.2, 1.5 to 1.8 threshold seems to be uh, what, um, what you know, causes them the most problems. Um, and then a big thing that causes them issues is lightning. So um, that is actually the biggest risk to health and safety for the individual uh, technicians that are out there. The, the life and death situations come in the lightning ones, because if you have rough seas and you get out there, the vessel captain is not going to let them transfer if he thinks it's too rough. And even if the, the forecast is technically below limits, if you get out there and the vessel's being hit by waves that are coming from different parts of the wave spectra, that can cause the boat to rock differently and the vessel captain might not allow them to go. So he's going to see that happening. Whereas with lightning, obviously, that's a much more difficult thing to, to forecast and it's a much more difficult thing to know whether it's if the thunderstorm is two or three miles away or if it's whether it's you know 10 15 miles away how much of a risk is a lightning strike on the wind farm so we're very cautious around lightning and most of the contact we have with the marine coordinators particularly in the summer uh, is around uh, highlighting uh, lightning that, that's going on visibility is an issue as well um, so getting the boat to the turbine it doesn't really matter if it's foggy, they can get out there. Um, that's not really an issue. Where visibility causes them problems is that if the wind farm is fully foggy, um, and let's say their maintenance program that particular day wants to put a team on one side of the wind farm and another team on the other, then they would normally go and drop off one team at this turbine and then go through the wind farm to the other side, drop them off at another turbine. 
Um, but if it's foggy and there's an incident that occurs and someone gets injured, then they can't very quickly go and get them because even though they can see where the turbines are, they can't go as fast in the boats to get to people. So what they'll typically do in foggy situations is scale down their their maintenance and stay the, the ctv will stay right next to the turbine that the guys are working on so if there's an issue they can get down and get back to shore safely as quickly as possible and then icing um, is another problem so two minutes yeah right, th this is pretty much it so icing is another issue um, that we do have um, so this is particularly an issue for perhaps our you know swedish wind farm that we're working for and some of the ones we work for the north of scotland but um in the winter time those blades can accumulate ice on them as they're spinning around um, and there have been incidents where boats have been going up to the the turbine and seen huge chunks of ice fall off of the turbine onto the platform below and so obviously they have to be very careful in those situations about putting people underneath a turbine where big chunks of ice could be falling off. So they have to do inspections of the blades by binoculars and that sort of thing before they approach them if there's a risk of lightning or icing rather in the forecast. So those are some of the things, those are some of the challenges that these wind farms are going through on a day-to-day -day basis in order to deliver all the power that we're interested in, in talking about here today. And so there's a lot of work going on and kind of not really behind the scenes, but to keep these things up and running, um, there, there's a lot of weather that, that affects those. And, and the last thing that I was just going to say is that we have been working on trying to improve that um, life lightning uh, forecast. So as many of you know, forecasting lightning in a computer model is a challenge. Uh, it is getting better. There are parameters now that are uh, producing lightning forecasts from computer models, but we're using a lot of machine learning at WeatherQuest to take observations from a long-term period, uh, compare that to the model output, and to try to forecast um, uh, lightning um, from a machine learning perspective. So this uh, image here is just a lightning climatology showing how frequent lightning is around the UK um, in a 10 kilometer radius. But most of these wind farms operate where if lightning occurs within 50 kilometers, they have to take some kind of action. So that's what it looks like if you start to look at how often that occurs um, in uh, in a 50 kilometer radius. So you can see the numbers there. There's quite a few days of the year that are impacted by lightning. And some of the more recent research that we've been looking at is actually suggesting that particularly in the cold season, that these wind farms are having an influence on how often lightning occurs. So um, the wind farm that's uh, at uh, Thornton Bank um, uh, on the uh, bottom right hand side of the image here is suggesting that because that wind farm has been there for the period of time that we've had our climatology, um, there seems to be a bullseye around where that wind farm is. Uh, whereas if you look at some of the other wind farms that are newer, there isn't as much of a signal and some of them that have been there a bit longer, like Greater Gabbard and Galloper, are starting to show up sig signals as well. And it does seem to be more of a cold season issue than it is in the warm season. And my guess initially is that it's similar to helicopter uh, blade icing issues that are um, uh, that you can have in, in, in that situation. So we know that there's a risk of, of lightning around um, helicopters uh, when they're flying through cold cloud and it's, it's got mixed phase going on in it as well. So that's some of the stuff that WeatherQuest are doing. Again, it's much more short, short term look and a people focused look at things. But hopefully you found that interesting and it's given you some insight on the daily the daily operations. And then first, um, so one of your slides showed the uh, the weather forecast data broken down, and I was just interested in how you get across probabilistic forecasts. I think for lightning, you had green and yellow and different. Yeah. Is that related to the kind of percentage likelihood? Yes. Yeah. So for the the green, the yellow. Um, so it'd be green, yellow, amber, or red for lightning. And what we've done is we've looked at a long period of time and our forecast. And we've basically said that if you have yellow in your forecast, it is expected that lightning will occur 
in this percentage of times. If it's in amber, it's this percentage and, and red, so on, so that they know that not only are, we're not just picking some random percentage out of the air, it is actually based on how often that has occurred in those forecasts in the past. So that's something that we are continually updating and, and talking. As far as handling the uncertainty elsewhere, um, that is mostly done by briefing. So one of the things I haven't said um, in the talk here is that for many of our wind farms, we will have a daily briefing with them. Um, so we will call the marine coordinator and speak to them in person over the phone um, and, and have a chat about what the, you know, the risk of certain weather variables eclipsing their thresholds are going to be. And that's particularly the case around lightning. So if there's any lightning in a forecast um, for any wind farm, then we're speaking to their marine coordinator at first at the very beginning of the day and then when lightning develops around the wind farm as well. It's about the mechanism for why the turbines create uh, lightning. Yeah, <laughs> so I, there are probably people in this room that can answer that question better than I can. Um, so does anybody want to have a go at it? <laughs> Paul? I, I mean, it, so it will be to do with the, the, the fact that you've got a super cooled cloud and as a turbine blade is swinging through that, it can generate some icing, I am assuming. Is that is that the idea, Paul? I'm looking at you because I feel like you probably know this answer. Yeah. And I guess you've got a large metal post stuck out in the middle of the sea. So if you're building up static, <laughs> it's going to be the place you yeah, can right. it. So. Yeah. Well, I would imagine that in most cases we're talking about, as I say, in the cold season. So we're talking about cloud bases that are that are fairly low um, over the sea with shallow convection that will be coming down from the north. Um, so probably only a few thousand feet uh, in terms of cloud bases rather than, you know, eight, ten thousand feet like you might get in a in a summertime thunderstorm. So did I see a hand go up in the middle or was I imagining it? I might have been there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I think in this area, there's there's maybe sometimes a, a tension right between wind farm operators and maybe third party service providers and and, and maybe contractual arrangements around if the forecast says this, you must yeah. do that. Mm. I wonder if you could reflect on that. Yeah, that, so so this is an issue. So basically you'll have a, a power company that owns the wind farm. But most of the people doing the actual work on the wind farm are from a third party contractor that will also have their own weather forecaster or forecasting provider. So the wind farm has, for example, WeatherQuest is a forecasting provider, but the contractor might be getting their forecast from somewhere else. Um, they're at odds on each other about what the lightning risk is that day. Uh, but ultimately, um, the marine coordinator, I think, is the one who is responsible for making decisions on who is going to be where on the wind farm that day. And then, as I say, it kind of follows that that um, that chain of command where the vessel captains would call people down. But in a lightning situation, um, I think the marine coordinator ultimately would make the call on whether they're going to have that, you know, whether they're going to make that risk to go out on a yellow day, for example, where there's a five or 10 percent risk of lightning. Um, but most of them have that written into um, their their workflow. So they will have policies that say if there's X amount of hours that are that are yellow in a row, then we're not going out this day or or, if I, or you know, something along those lines. OK, great. Can you join me? In, oh, can you hold your question for the Q&A? Um, <laughs> can you join me in thanking Chris? We'll move on to our final thought. 
OK, so um, our fourth and final talk for this afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Mike, Mark Rodwell. And I'm just going to find your question mark. There we go. Um, I think probably an opportunity for me again to thank ECMWF for hosting us and Mark in particular, who uh, helped us to pull this meeting together and obviously deliver it here at ECMWF as well. So Mark is the coordinator for diagnostics at, here at ECMWF. Uh, he focuses on evaluating ensemble forecast system performance and uh, identifying areas for improvement. And I'm going to hand over to Mark, who will give us an ECMWF perspective. I don't know what I've done there. Um, OK, thank you very much, Liz. I hope you were aware that my job title didn't mention anything about energy. <laughs> um, so uh, there's quite a lot of interesting work going on at ECMWF and with its um, uh, various partners uh, in various different parts of ECMWF. And so the idea was to try to draw, draw these things together. And so I'm going to be talking about it. So I need to thank a few people who have helped me put this talk together, particularly Emma, SD, Nube and uh, Thomas here. So um, what I thought I'd talk about then, first of all, is um, some of the data that's available um, at ECMWF, particularly um, for, for helping in the renewable sector. Um, looking at a, an exciting new kind of project um, funded by the EU, uh, it's the, the main overarching pro project is uh, Destination Earth. But one thing that they are trying to do is to, to develop sort of on-demand forecasting so high resolution on-demand forecasting so you know where it, that might be appropriate say for wind farms or so on then there's uh, something more at the sort of um the sort of longer time scales the european network for transmission system operators for electricity a very long name and they sort of administer this pan-european climate database so um, i'll talk a little bit about about that and and how that's um developing um a tiny bit about forecast verification of some of our forecasts here and then the last thing which is sort of more associated with what i'm interested in but it's looking at the sort of interface between between the forecasters and the users and how we can sort of work together kind of thing so first of all, then the sort of data side of things. Um, so um, there's a sort of quite a, a big spectrum of data available um, for for the renewable sector. And so, as I say, ECMWF produce quite a lot of this with their third party um, sort of partners. So there's Copernicus, there's the EU funded Copernicus um, project and this Destination Earth, as I mentioned. Um, I guess, and it's over a whole range of timescales, which I'll talk about, but I guess that the, one of the key things is that the value of the data that's available is really determined by the application, by the users. And that's actually a really interesting thing for us to learn, you know, what, what where, where the value is in the data, because that will obviously help us um, prioritise things in, in, in developing. Um, a nice thing is that there are, there are common parameters that exist across a lot of different time ranges. And that provides us the ability to produce sort of more integrated um, parameters that can be assessed over these different time ranges. So on the, the left hand side, we've got era five. This is the reanalysis that's already been dis discussed, but looking at, you know, the last um, back perhaps to 1940 or so, but going back in time, looking at the past weather, re-ingesting the observations and trying to get the best estimate of past weather. Um, then we have the analysis, which is like the present, the present weather, short range, maybe a few days, um, and then our medium range forecast, which goes to uh, 15 days, and then sub-seasonal, um, which sort of goes to about 46 days, and then the seasonal and and, and on into climate. Uh, and so there's a lot of parameters that exist over all of these time ranges. So that means that it should be a more sort of seamless way of, of incorporating them into the workflow. So what sort of um, um, applications uh, could the data be used for? So this is, um, Emma's just put this down. So this is uh, just basically for a wind application, she says, so there's many more. And I thought this is quite nice uh, from what we heard earlier about the um, 
you know, what are the users at different different? What's the user profile at different lead times? I think it's quite interesting. Here's here's some some ideas for 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 the wind farm, but it'd be interesting to to get that kind of profile. So in the reanalysis, you've got things like site selection. So looking back at the statistics and trying to work out where's the best place to to site a wind farm. Um, there's more com complicated things you can do. I was talking to some people from Australia where they you can start to sort of um, balance um, sites. So, you know, you know, if this one site is going to have a lot of power and the other site's not, but the weather, when it shifts, it's the other way around. There's a way of sort of integrating these things. And of course, that would apply over the, the whole of Europe as well. Um, so there's interesting sort of work there. Then there's a sort of grid integration, which I understand is, you know, sort of putting in all of the, um, the, the, the energy sources um, at the present time. And then there's various operational planning um, and trading, I guess, um, of of um, energy uh, as you go out to the longer lead times. The maintenance scheduling, that's obviously a slightly longer time to, to the scale that we just we heard about, but um, the sort of uh, scheduling boats and things like that uh, and so on as you can go out. And of course, the longer lead times, I guess it's the it's the investment and the the financial sides, which can probably make most use of the, the forecasts. So there's quite a few different sources um, of renewable energy. Um, so we, we often just seem to talk about wind or, or solar, but there's quite a few here. Um, so here we've got a sort of list of the various different energy types and the sort of weather parameters that are, are kind of needed to, to work out the, you know, the, the power the potential power so of course with wind you've got wind speed and direction but other aspects of the wind, um, air turbulence and so on it's important um, solar energy it's not just the solar irradiance but there's the cloud there's the aerosol and so on that's important um, hydro um, obviously you've got precipitation but uh, as we've been talking at the break snow belt is also important and of course evaporation as well um, so there's various different other forms of energy. Uh, um, and the last one, sort of hydrogen, I guess, uh, is sort of feeding off those ones. So it sort of looks at the uh, the wind and solar and so on as a way of generating the hydrogen. So there's all these parameters that, you know, are available for people to use and to combine to 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 get their various different, to uh, predict their energy or their, or their power production. Um, so moving on to um, this sort of destination Earth. Um, so this is, as I said, this is a very a big project within Europe, doing many things, trying to to, to make very high resolution forecasts. Um, but there's a lot more to it. But this is one aspect, and this is um, uh, their sort of on-demand approach. Um, but this is just an example. Then, so here's um, uh, the the wind farms for Belgium. So you can see they're actually sort of stacked very close together. Um, uh, off the coast of Belgium, um, and they provide about 10% of uh, Belgium's uh, energy electricity consumption on average. So it's quite quite important. Um, February 2022, they set a new record. So 94,000 megawatt hours. So there's a lot of energy produced on that day. So it's obviously a pretty pretty windy day. So it's quite quite good. Um, but then occasionally you get something on the horizon like Storm Eunice uh, a few days later. Um, so you've got this big storm being predicted, uh, one of the strongest uh, storms in the last 30 years. Um, and we've, we've heard about, you know, shutting down um, turbines and things, and that's certainly part of it. But in fact, there was actually quite good production here because, there's, you know, if you don't need to shut them down at places, then you can actually produce quite a lot of uh, electricity. Um, but the proximity of the farms is, is an issue because it means that if the storm is coming by, it's going to affect them all at the same time, effectively. So it's not that you can you're not sort of hedging your bets, I, I guess, like that. So this is this sort of on-demand approach. So this is a forecast, um, sort of three days ahead, uh, and this is from uh, the ECMWF uh, ensemble forecast, and this is looking at 10 meter wind gusts, um, and this is used to trigger this on-demand process. So I, I should say this is a sort of demonstration at the moment. It's it's something that's in, in development. But the idea is then you, you trigger this uh, on-demand process by see, seeing this very strong, uh, very big potential for strong strong gusts over, over 
the North Sea to go. So what does that do then? So that triggers um, the, the running. So you, you, you take your very high resolution model and you sort of move it to the right location um, where you see these, uh, these strong winds. And then you, dr you drive that with boundary conditions from uh, another forecasting model, uh, the sort of called the global digital twin. But the, the high resolution model might be a resolution of, say, two and a half kilometers or so. So the idea is that you get much better granularity of the forecast um, at the actual wind farm site. So here then are the, the predictions from the on-demand forecast for a particular wind, wind farm and the, the observations that came out at the end of the day. And you can see how reasonably good, you know, the forecast of the winds is compared to, to what actually happened um, at 100 meters. And so then you can drive with those winds, of course, you can drive um, um, power, power models. So there's various different models um, that can, can derive the power from, from the wind. And again, you can see here that the, the power that was being, um, was being predicted in purple and the observed power. And the key, the key thing here, I guess, is that um, on, the, on the 18th of February around 12, uh, 12 noon, there's, a, there's this big drop um, in power there. But basically when, the, the, when they were being, the, the turbines were being shut down because the wind was going to be too strong. So you see then the drop in the power. Um, before that, you see that sort of plateau at the top. That's effectively when we saw that the, the, the turbines were at their maximum efficiency. So that's where it sort of get that flat, flat part at the top. So that's the idea of here is to try to develop a system that can sort of react quite quickly. Um, so you've got a three day forecast. You, if it's if showing a problem somewhere in this particular case, you know, it might be for winds, for, for, for wind farms, but it could be for other, other issues as well. Um, you then you drive your high resolution model and try to, to try to improve the prediction. Um, so moving on to um, this um, uh, ENSOE, this European Network for Transmission System Operators uh, for Electricity. So it's quite a, quite a mouthful. But this is basically a sort of uh, organization which is responsible for the secure and coordinated operation of uh, Europeans' electric systems. So it's, it's trying to think about, you know, in the future, for example, um, will we have enough supply to, to meet the demand? Uh, and those kind of things. So, you know, quite a lot of um, work involved there. And what they um, do is administer this pan-European climate database. Um, so, um, and that sort of does things like, you know, assess resource adequacy and so on like that, and making sure the system doesn't fail. Uh, recently then um, there's been this um, sort of, um, agreement signed between ECMWF and NSOE um, and so on to, to start providing more kind of information to this database. So not only based on the reanalysis and the past weather, but also thinking about the climate going forward into the future. So the kind of things that are provided here um, are sort of climate, climate variables, so 10 meter, 100 meter winds, um, temperatures and um, can sort of be population weighted if necessary, um, the so solar radiation, the, the various different things which are important um, for the energy, total precipitation, so on. But not only that, then the not only the climate variables, but then these are then used to drive these various different energy models to produce the energy variables. So the generation from wind, hydro and um, solar and so on. So as I say, there's two, two temporal streams um, going to be available, the, the historical one, but also going for the sort of projection, um, the projected stream as well here. And these are based on um, climate forecasts that are included in this CMIP-6. Some people may be familiar, but it's sort of bringing a lot of different climate models from around the world um, and driving them with um, emission scenarios and so on to, to try to project the, the future climate. So that data will be then used to, to produce these various different climate variables. Um, so the, the, the sort of domain here is European, basically European countries that are signed up. So this sort of um, map here and the various different offshore zones. Um, the resolution 0.25 um, degrees, um, 
and there will be, as I say, there'll be the climate variables um, and various different spatial aggregations. So over sort of social economic regions and so on, and also the uh, the energy variables. And this temporarily, then you're sort of getting solar and wind hourly and sort of hydro weekly. So there's quite a lot of information here. Uh, so one thing about I mentioned these conversion models here, they can be a little bit flexible. So turbines are not always the same height, the same design. Um, so we, there is uh, an ability to, to modify various different as aspects of the turbine um, and so on to, to, to and, the, and the tilt, say, of the um, solar and so on to um, to model this as accurately as possible. Uh, and so this is sort of um, at this sort of beta stage now where this a lot of information is becoming available um, to, to download. Um, I did have a look yesterday to see to see what I could get out. So it, it sort of looked um, quite quite interesting, the data that you can get out of there. So um, might be worth looking maybe, you know, in the in the in the near future. Yeah, I think it could be very useful. Um, so um, so looking at forecast verification then. So we need to know, um, you know, how good the forecasts are for for renewables. So here's just two plots of um, scores for forecasts. So on the the left hand side, we've got um, the how good the um, or should I say how bad the um, 100 meter winds are, because these are errors that are plotted here. So the 100 meter wind speed errors um, at a lead time of five days. So that's quite a long lead time. Um, and this is averaged over the forecast for this last uh, summer, June to, to August. Um, so you, this is the root mean square error relative to own analysis. It's interesting, it's own analysis. Um, of course, you know, there are issues with getting data at 100 meters from wind farms. That's slightly proprietary information. So the best, you know, often we can do is to just um, compare it with our own analysis. Uh, of course, that gives us the, the no gaps approach as well, I guess, that we heard about. But you can see the larger errors over the oceans compared to, to Europe, say. But um, at day five, um, we're getting errors, I guess, you know, in the sort of North Sea of, you know, around about four meters per second or so. On the right hand side, then, is the, um, the solar, the downward solar at the surface. Uh, uh, so this is the standard deviation of the error. This is 24 hour averaged uh, insulation. Now we're comparing against uh, satellite data here. So I guess that's why there's sort of gaps um, in some places. Um, so again, I guess there's, there's larger errors over the oceans, um, maybe, maybe typically 60 watts per meter squared at that point uh, and less um, in other places. Um, so that's the sort of the state at, at the moment in sort of deterministic forecast skill. You can also plot how it's changed over time. And um, there is a downward trend. If you look at the, the, the 12 months running mean through the, the winds and also the solar, but it looks, you know, sort of, it's not a dramatic thing over time. So this, this is the last, you know, eight years or so. We are making progress, gradually uh, improving things. Uh, the, the up and down shows the monthly averages. So you can see that certain times of the year, harder to predict than than other times of the year um, so for, for wind and, and solar um, yes uh, I guess also happening at the moment ECMWF is, is quite a lot of input from AI models we now have an um, artificial intelligence forecasting system AIFS and that you know may well show pro promise in terms of um, improving these these forecasts um, but we've also heard recently uh, in previous talk about the importance of thinking about sort of probabilistic scores and the use of probabilistic information. So that's what I sort of wanted to move on to on the last part of my talk. Um, so this is this sort of idea of trying to have a sort of thriving private sector, but also delivers for society. So this is the sort of analogy I have in mind, the sort of rugby match here. You've got two teams competing. Um, maybe, you know, different parts of the energy sector or something. They're trying to compete in, in the marketplace. But at the same time, they need to entertain the audience society in a sense. So we need to, to sort of do two things. We need to get this thriving private sector in creating energy, but also make sure that the, the sector as a whole 
is moving forward as quickly as possible in terms of renewables, I guess. So that's the sort of idea. Um, so the user's decisions are, you know, they're based on uh, risk and reward. They and obviously probabilities are involved there. So, for example, you know, um, uh, a power, a, a wind farm might, might want to to contract a certain amount of energy. Um, but if, if they don't deliver it because there's not enough wind, then they're going to pay a penalty. So they know about these costs and, and losses and so on and, 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 and the probabilities. The ensemble forecasts that we have where we make several forecasts or say 50 forecasts with slightly different initial conditions and so on, give us the probabilities or you know, at least estimates of the probabilities um, of particular weather features happening. Um, and what forecasters want to do uh, is to make their forecasts reliable. And that means that the probability of any event, particular event, say P, um, the actual outcome should happen a fraction P of the time, effectively. So if you predict a 50% chance of, of a certain wind strength, then on those times that you, you do that prediction, you would expect it to occur 50% of the time. And that's a really important attribute of forecasts. So it's called reliability. Um, and that's what forecasters really want to do to improve the forecasting system. Uh, and so, you know, the development of the forecasting system is based on proper scores. Proper scores are ex exactly these scores which try to encourage um, reliability. But the users uh, optimize their decisions based on probabilities as well, or it would be nice for them to do so. Um, and it turns out that if they do that, then their gain in pounds and pence or whatever, the actual gain uh, that they make after the, you know, the event has happened is in fact a proper score of the forecast system if they, if they do optimize it with, against those pressures, those the probabilities. Um, so basically there is a common playing field. I should say there's quite a few puns in this, this text here relating to the figure, but there is a common playing field here, uh, sort of common objective that would be really nice to try to develop. And I, I, we, we've heard of things that might be improving that um, as we go forward. So factors in play, you know, for a particular lead time then, we have a weather event. So for example, wind speed greater than 25 meters per second. There are certain weather events which are crucial. We heard about these times when you turn off turbines or, or points where the turbine um, power curve is, is, is rising very quickly. And we also heard about it for the maintenance and so on, things like that. So there are certain weather sort of thresholds or events which, um, which are particularly important. Uh, we also heard about this situation um, of the of the high demand but low um, low supply of renewables in this sort of blocking situation that you can get sometimes. Um, uh, so that might be particular weather circulation types which cause problems, which might be a weather event. Um, hail, I know, can be a problem for solar farms as well. So there are various different features and so on. So there's the weather event. There's also the decision to be to be made. So, um, you know, do you shut down the turbine? Do you promise X amount of energy? There's so many different sort of decisions that could be made. Um, then there's the probability of the event, as I said. And so there's the gain, effectively, the profit, the penalty, the overall gain that is made by, by the user once they've made the decision. There's the ground truth, you know, the observations of the weather or the power production um, that is, the, is useful then for assessing how well the forecast did. Um, so sometimes some of that ground truth is sort of propriety information, some other things might be as well. And the, I would like to think that it's, it needn't impede, um, you know, the development of forecasts. We've said we've got this common playing field of trying to effectively improve proper scores of the forecast system. So, I'd say that you know the events and the threshold probabilities, the probability at which you would make a make a, a decision, are really important for assessing the forecast. But the actual decision itself is not really of much consequence for 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 the forecasters in a sense. So that's some information that you might not need to give, still be allowed, still be able to assess the forecast systems. Um, and uh, uh, in a previous previous Royal Metsoc meeting, we actually came up with this 
with this, it ended up with this paper here. Uh, we came up with something called the user Briar score, which is a way of combining all of the users' um, events and, um, and thresholds to produce a score of a sort of user um, score of the forecast system. Um, users might be able to provide forecast errors rather than observations. So, you know, they don't necessarily need to give the observations at their wind farm, but they could just give the errors relative to the forecast and it, it might not need, even need to have the sort of location and so on. Uh, various different ways of anonymizing data and so on. And sort of more aggregated approach to power production. So there's all these different ways that I'd like, I don't know, it'd be nice to sort of try to, to work towards um, you know, better coordination between the forecasting and the and the user community and renewals. Try to, to try to develop the whole um, system going forward. Um, so that's it. So basically, just as a summary, basically, was the contents. But uh, yeah, thanks. A lot of food for thought there. Um, I'm going to take one question for Mark, and then I'm, while we're doing that, I'm going to invite our two speakers up to the front. We're moving to a seamlessly into a QA. and a um, So is there a particular question for Mark? <laughs> yes. Just wait for the mic to move. Ben and Chris have been up. Yep, thanks, Mark. Um, I just had a question about the next cycle upgrade. Um, you're going to be uh, simulating two meter temperature observations. Do you think that will improve the uh, the renewable forecast as you showed that time series? Do you reckon it'll be a big jump in improvement? Um, uh, I don't. I, I mean, we do actually have the scores. But I don't know offhand what it does to say the hundred meter winds and so on. Um, it does improve the two meter temperature scores, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure what it would do for that. Yeah, but uh, there's yeah, there's plenty of information on the next upgrade on the ECMWF website now. So and the scorecards. Yes, they are, they're all there. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Right. OK, we're going to move into Q&A now. Um, obviously, Emily had to leave, so we haven't got a Met Office representative at the front, although I believe there might be people in the audience who could help. Um, so general questions, I think, to uh, the three speakers, uh, whether that's regarding um, the, the kind of research going on behind the scenes and the uh, state of the UK climate report that uh, Ben mentioned for the energy sector, or whether that is specific to some of the services that are being delivered by ECMWN and other press or all the Met Office as well. The broader questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Donaldson, University of Birmingham. I think in a, a variety of the talks, there was discussion of the use of probabilistic forecasts, but then also how do you make decisions with that uncertainty in, in the different domains, uh, whether it be, you know, renewables or, you know, operators or in, in those contexts. I was curious in those conversations beyond providing the forecast and the metric and the number, how do you see that then translate in the conversations around the use of the forecast in the energy sector? Do you think people tend to be more conservative and those conversations then lead to uh, decisions that are more conservative than the numbers might suggest? Or uh, are there any other observations or insights you could offer from the various stakeholder groups that you're engaging with around their use of, of the data to make decisions? I want to go first with that. Oh, well, I could just say, I mean, we heard about, you know, the sort of the financial trading sort of at the longest lead times, I guess. Um, they're, they're sort of you know, fairly au fait with the probabilities and they're sitting behind desks and spreadsheets and don't worry. If you're at the top of a, a wind turbine, um, you know, these probabilities perhaps mean less, you know, you, you're, you're going to jump down the turbine at a, a very small probability of lightning. So, well, I would anyway. Yeah. So I guess the, the use of probabilities does depend somewhat, you know, on the context like that. Anybody else? Well, I, I was just going to say that more, more and more from my side of things. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, more and more from from the kind of operational side of things, um, there are kind of documents that are written that that kind of highlight if the probability is above or below X threshold, then we're this is the decision we're going to make. Um, but 
previously that hasn't been in place as much and it is amazing how much variability there is from one wind farm to another in terms of the way a marine coordinator an individual marine coordinator at the different wind farms might react to things like a lightning risk or whether or not to send out the boat if the wave height forecast is right on threshold some of them are you know so it, there still is a lot of sort of personal decision in that uh, amongst what kind of risk they're willing to kind of absorb them themselves um but but more and more so you're seeing it kind of written that if it if it if x probability is um exceeded then we're not going to do this anymore so i just pick up on that so there, there are definitely organizations out there that take that data and put it into power models are you aware of anybody who's putting them into risk models anybody in the audience who would take weather data and actually drive it into risk models to make decisions on this? No. Okay. I guess that's maybe more of a question for people in insurance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I guess the other thing as well, um, just thinking about probabilistic data is, is the understanding of what a 30% probability means. So again, and Mark, I think, had a really good, clear definition of that. But is that well understood by the, the kind of wider community, the user community? So I guess that's an issue there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not someone who puts it in risk models in anger, but I'm someone who studies people who might put it in risk models, I guess. Um, it, it seems to me a lot of the problem is actually identifying things that can be done. Actually, particularly when you move to the longer range, the S2S range is where it tends to start. Actually, getting people to think about decisions that could be taken is quite challenging beyond the traders. Certainly traders bite your arm off, but the but everyone else is kind of trying to work out what decisions might be. I also think there's often a danger of kind of oversimplifying decisions to just think about the thresholds of probabilities and maybe to run that through a cost-loss model. A lot of decisions have their own dynamics, their own memory behind them. So there's actually your actions today can constrain your actions in the future. So there's actually a role for that memory and that modeling of what the actual impact is in the process and the dynamics of the system that you're affecting that gets overlooked when we just kind of go to the cost loss model type stuff which powerful as it is um, and has its place i think we can oversimplify that a little bit sometimes can you keep hold of the mic have you any suggestions of how we might resolve that <laughs> yeah. um, I, i'm actually a big fan of mark's model of this getting the, the a, a, a thriving the bubbling up sector of people working in this space to support that translation. I don't think the National Weather Service and the like can do it the whole shebang themselves. There's so much need for tailoring to particular settings and particular decisions. The other part I think there's a lot more need for is that pipeline of data. So the fact that a lot of the using of forecasts and so forth have become public, I think has been fantastic. We should should have followed the American model for that years ago, really, I think. Um, and my own area tends to be a lot more towards the climate end of things. Um, I think that pipeline from such the CMIP type experiments coming that bringing that through and bringing that into the climate service development space is something that's very important because it's quite telling you the fact that uh, the NOE PCD version 4.1 whatever it is there's only a handful of models there that's partly because the data has never been produced it's never been output there mm -hmm. and I think actually we need to work with the modeling centers to convince them of the case of why this data is needed and a lot of it is quite high demand data, you know, it's, it's hourly variables and it, it's things like that that we need actually out of these models that have never been done before as a regular matter of practice. So I think that there's, there's pipeline questions, but I think overall, I think Mark's model is the right one, is kind of having a lot of people working on small detail problems is, is where we need to be. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Comment about the use of probabilities, but there's a time scale as well, isn't there? I mean, when you, if you have to put warnings out for forecasts, if you if you put them far ahead, then to some extent the probabilities have to be low because of the uncertainty. But as you get nearer to the validation time, uh, the probabilities and the risk factors, you know, they have to go up. Um, you know, you if you if you like, if you know that. The likely is going to occur somewhere in your 50 kilometers it's 100 percent you know um, or, you know, or very high and and you have to convey that don't you in uh, in practice 
Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's, uh, you know, one of the the reasons why you kind of have to get these old school Marine coordinators out of the um, out of the mindset that uh, getting an email at 6 a.m. in the morning is all they need to make a decision on the wind farm for the day, because obviously um, the probability does change as the, you know, convective trends of the day do. So um, it is constantly being updated. And and uh, partly that, I mean, one of the things that we do at WeatherQuest is that we do go out and train all these marine coordinators at every wind farm that we work for we go and have a one or two day training session with them about how to do some weather analysis themselves so how to read a weather radar uh making sure they understand and and are getting the lightning alert messages when they're when they're meant to be and 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 being able to say okay i've got this alert message that says there's been a lightning strike 65 kilometers to my southwest well i mean we're obviously going to be in contact with them that them being able to see that on a weather radar and know that that shower is moving due north and it's probably not going to come over the wind farm um, and there are some frustrating parts of that as well. I mean, you know, that so, you know, some wind farms will have a, a procedure that if lightning occurs within that 50 kilometer radius, then they start taking people down off the, the, the wind farm. But it might be that, you know, on the edge of that 50 kilometer radius, the, the thunderstorms moving, as I say, due north and not heading towards their, their wind farm. So therefore, it's never really a risk over the wind farm, but yet they have to do something about it. So there's a lot of kind of educating and sitting with them and more and more so that the, the ones that we work with have been inviting us in on their, um, you know, rewording policies and that sort of thing about how they how they manage that. So. Could I ask the question? <laughs> it's about the state of the climate, uh, the energy uh, report. Because I, I, I found it fascinating. Uh, it seems to fill a, a, a really a hole for me anyway. I just wonder what the, the plans are going forward. There's some feedback here, but uh, what are your... Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I think it's kind of dependent upon sort of the feedback that we get this year. I think that's really important that we, we get feedback on the report when it comes out in the next few weeks. And that we can sort of collate that and use that for next year. I think the idea is hopefully to do something fairly similar. I think it'd be great if we could have uh, greater coverage of uh, DNA fault data, which I know we've already talked about um, in the break. Um, and yeah, I know that we've also got this project at Reading to try and get the live energy reanalysis data sets, uh, which I was talking about in my talk, um, updated as ERA 5 is released. So that would be at a four month lag. So we'd have um, essentially like a landing page with plots of the wind power generation and the UK electricity demand um, from four months previous. Um, and then we would have that data available to download to sort of get it out there and to get people using it. So that's potentially something interesting as well. Yeah, I think I think a great question. So again, I you know, we talked about this around Ben's talk. I think it's really important to get feedback mm. on this year's report. First time we've done this. And as you say, there was a rationale as to why we wanted to do it. There was a gap there. Um, I think it's a great report and I think it will land really well with a lot of positive feedback, but there's, you know, it's, it will grow and develop over the coming years. So the more feedback and the more input we can get into that, the better really. Yeah. Mark. Can I ask a question around Destination Earth? Um, probably to Mark then, because again, that on-demand idea I think is fantastic, but how, how does that work in practice? Do you know? Um, well, as much as I know, not much more than than what I I said. Um, uh, yeah, um, I guess um, there's there's still a lot of work to go on there too. But, um, you know, I don't know exactly. You know how you would choose. You know, you have these different different. It's not just the winds, but there are other. Um, the sort of Cape Shear, sort of the, the risk of sort of severe you know, thunderstorms and that kind of thing. There are other different things that come in, come into triggering it. And so, uh, yeah, how, how many times a year you can run it mm -hmm. and so on. And, you know, whether you can run multiple, if you've got two, two events at the same time and that kind of thing. I don't know, there's, there's quite a few things to, to, to iron out there, but I'm not really the expert on that, I'm afraid to. And I guess as an EU project, you'll mm -hmm. have EU countries that are, you know. Yes. So you get, you'll yeah. get maybe pressures from different countries and yeah that could well be the case yeah and that the the model that's uh, the various different european models used in that sort of on demand yeah. so this this uh, um, so is, harmony is and so on. vc running the sub 
grid model? Or no. Would that be run by Limber? Yeah, so that's, yeah, so, yeah, the EC stops at the uh, the um, the global yeah. digital twin, so, um, okay. that, which is already a high resolution, but then, yeah, yeah the on-demand, I think, is basically contracted out um, yeah. to be run, yeah. So just, just thinking about, from a, say, wind generation, if you're going to do some work on, say, building a new wind farm and there was an event like this and you could focus in on particular areas, say, of the North Sea, you could see this being useful in a particular application? Or do you think it's more for national weather services that are saying there's a big event coming? So generally, I want to get a real grasp of what's going on. Yeah, I, it's really it's really a sort of emergency sort of services yeah. thing at the moment, I think. But yeah. And it might have power for a, a big event. So I don't know, Paris Olympics. Yes, yeah, definitely you know? that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I just had a quick question on that because I was interested. So is the sort of high or the on-demand threshold based on, well, high wind speeds in your example there, or is it based more on confidence of the forecast? Um, uh, the it's it's the triggering is based from the ensemble, so there will be mm. some confidence, I, I guess, associated with it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm not the person. To... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess picking up on that, is, is... So this is going to come across sounding very harsh and don't mean this way. Is it in danger of being the Betamax in the sense of uh, where, where does the AI, FS and sort of these super resolution RCM type techniques fit with this? It sort of feels like running an NWP for, you know, hey, here's an alarm, run a, run a case study kind of thing, for run a downscale of that one. But there's so many different class of events, so many different countries, so many different things we might want to do it for. Uh, how does it fit with that kind of AI world that's emerging? Um um, as the thought being comes yeah, I, I mean, AI, I mean, Destination Earth was originally conceived as being, you know, very high resolution um, modeling. Um, but in the last couple of years, I say AI has sort of come in. And so I guess the, the focus of Destination Earth will be responding to that. Um, but I can't really say much more than that. But AI is obviously playing a, a big part these days. Yeah. We actually started doing this sort of on demand thing 20, uh, 20 odd years ago. Um, at the Met Office, uh, when we were starting to run kilometre scale models, and we couldn't afford to run a kilometre model you know, every 12 hours or even every day, and um, for the whole UK. Yeah. So um, I think it was Pete Clark came up with a, you know, once we got the model working, um, we kind of designated nine areas covering the UK. And the senior forecaster, or they call, call him chief forecaster, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, could decide on a particular day that we'd run this, but they couldn't do it every day because we didn't have enough computer power. So, you know, we actually started that business. The thing is, within a few years, we were able to run one kilometer or one and a half kilometers. You know, now we run it well four or more times a day. Um, but the but the focus now is going down to 300 meters. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, city scale, uh, you know, airport scale models, uh, which you know, even though they're covering a small area, they're very expensive to run yeah. when you run with you know two or three hundred millimeter, uh, two hundred three hundred meter um, grid lens, or you know, even one hundred meter uh, experimentally. Um, so there might always be you know, a demand to run the highest resolution on demand yeah. um, in particular situations. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, the Met Office have been fortunate in that sense as the National Met Service to have that facility. And as you say, it's used. I mean, they, they had the uh, high res one for the London Olympics. I think they ran it for the Paris Olympics as well uh, this, this year. But I guess across Europe, the other Met services aren't haven't got that kind of luxury to to tap into that. So I guess that's what Destination Earth is trying to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and develop computing new computing sort of um, you know scale to computing resources as well. Yeah, but it's how that decision's done within the Met Office. It's kind of easier to make that decision, isn't it, about where and which situation but across Europe it becomes a well big you know all countries will have more and more access to cloud computing and they don't necessarily you know have to have a, a daily contract if you like yeah um you know they might be able to do it that way but it it is more difficult if you haven't got 
if you can't just commandeer the computer yeah. when you want it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Yep. Thanks very much. Um, I had a question thinking about forecast skill. Um, maybe there's slightly different uh, takes from from all three of you. Um, Mark, I think it was really interesting that you talked about these kind of maybe you call them user oriented skill scores. And I think that's really important that we think about that as we try and provide the forecast to the users. So it'd be interesting to hear a bit more about about those and if you're implementing those and using them um, in, in model and, and forecast development. Um, maybe from Mike, it would be interesting to hear if you account for the skill of the forecasts and do you see different situations and synoptic situations maybe where the forecasts are more skillful and, and how do you respond to that? Um, and how do people on the ground react to, to false things like false alarms? Um, and then maybe looking to the future of the report, one thing that I was quite keen to look at this year that we didn't quite get time to do was to try and think about the skill and the predictability of these events. So I don't know, maybe Ben could say something about how we might look at that next year. Yeah, Mark, do you want to go first? Um, I was going to say something. I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry, I've asked three questions. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of meeting is sort of, you know, the, the aim of this kind of meeting is to sort of develop interest in this kind of idea. Um, I mentioned the sort of um, NSOE uh, stuff and the idea they've got these, these climate variables, but also this sort of energy variables. The, the hope is that these kind of variables would be um, would be calculated and scored at all all times and at the same time trying to develop a kind of user profile of, of what kind of events and thresholds are most important to sort of get some inventory like that but it's it's i guess it's it's you know gentle progress i guess it's not it's not there yet but yeah Chris? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, probably two points um, from your question. Uh, one about uh, synoptic patterns that are more or less forecastable in, in terms of the, the certainty in those. And I, I give a lot of talks to the general public around my area just about the you know weather forecasting and, uh, and, and various things. And a lot of the general public think that forecast certainty is a linear thing that the further you get out in the distance uh, the the less certain it's going to be um uh, and also you know especially students who are early in their um their career at university so i do some teaching in meteorology at, at uea as well they they kind of assume that the nearest model run the, the you know the newest model run is going to be the most uh, most accurate one so trying to kind of tell people i have a slide that i show in my public talk that shows some different weather patterns and i use an example from the the spring and early summer of 2018 when it was you know high pressure dominated and very dry across east anglia and i remember telling a farmer on the phone that i was a hundred percent certain he wasn't going to get a drop of rain for the next 15 days and i knew i was giving him a 15-day forecast with a hundred percent certainty and then a month later, he'll call back and ask if it's going to rain tomorrow afternoon. And I tell him, I don't know. So, you know, it, there is a lot of education around how to manage, you know, the pattern that we're in means that we're more confident about this um, and, and kind of teaching people. Um, the lightning thing is a bit more challenging because obviously the low end lightning risk we put out a lot of those, you know, uh, we we have our, our yellow right lightning category is a non zero risk of lightning because we don't want to give any sort of false you know, uh, security around that. So we tell our clients that, you know, if yellow is in there, then you really should speak to us because sometimes it, it's a very low risk and we're kind of just covering ourselves because there's going to be convective showers around, but we can see in the forecast profiles that they're not going to be up in the lightning generation region. And, you know, you're pretty confident there's not going to be, but the model's got showers over you. So how confident really are you? Um, and and so, you know, that the, it depends on the variable and, and lightning is one where I think you can get away with being a bit more overcautious. Final word to Ben before we wrap up this Q and A. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question, Matt, and a really good um, sort of point to finish. Because um, yeah, I guess there's different timescales for this. So for individual storms, how do the forecasts sort of shape up and work out? I know the interesting example for the period that we looked at was Storm Kieran, 
And there was lots of media attention about whether that would indeed affect the south of the UK, like the Great Storm of 1987. Thankfully, it didn't. So you could explore that for individual storms. Like Emily mentioned in her presentation as well, you could also explore the seasonal forecast outlook as well, which is potentially really interesting and see how that compared to expectations because it performed quite well last year. But there's also been times in recent years where actually it hasn't performed that well. Um, and there's not only the Met Office forecast, there's other forecasting centres like BCMWF and like, well, I guess different forecasting centres around the world that produce these things. Um, and then even for the entire year, so in my sort of PhD area of research, there are decadal forecasts for temperatures over the next year. So that would be an interesting thing to see how those verify as well. Great, okay, interesting discussion. So I just had two slides, which you've kind of seen because they flashed up, but just one to say, keep in touch, I hope you enjoyed the event. Uh, any feedback on the event? please do share that before you leave. Um, obviously, if you found it really useful, obviously feedback on the report we've talked about, that would be really helpful as, as that gets launched in the next uh, few weeks. Um, we have two upcoming events, which I think you may be interested in. So we start our masterclass series uh, on the 9th of October. Uh, this is something we've been running with University of Reading now for a number of years and we have a spring series and an autumn series so obviously this is the autumn one um, and uh, the, the focus of the masterclass is on high resolution to global storm uh, resolving models on the 9th of October and then there'll be a couple more that run at uh, during October and into November as well. And then also um, we've had the understanding of uh, the climate of the UK um, for an energy perspective. We have a meeting looking broader across uh, the understanding the climate of 2023 linked to the state of the UK climate and that's on the 16th of October, both online. So if you're interested, you can join virtually. Um, just uh, finally, to say again, a big thank you to ECMWF for hosting us. And if you can join me in thanking our four speakers, I know Emily's not here, but Emily, Ben, Mark and Chris.